What up, everybody? Welcome to the Smoking Tire Podcast. This episode is brought to you by Keeps. Listen, fact. Two out of three men will experience some form of hair loss by the time they are 35. I experienced multiple forms of hair loss by the time I was 30, all right? So I am the example that proves the rule. And more than 50 million men in the U.S. suffer from male pattern baldness. Now, there's only two FDA-approved medications that can help prevent hair loss, and Keeps offers both of them. Keeps offers a simple, stress-free way to keep the hair that you have. Convenient virtual doctor consultations and and medications get delivered straight to your door every three months so you don't have to leave your home. Keeps is affordable. Treatments start at just $10 per month and they offer generic versions of those two medications. All your products come in discreet packaging and we know that there's proven results. Keeps has more five-star reviews than any of their competitors and the thing is guys. Prevention is key. Treatments can take four to six months, so you want to start early and consistently. Act fast. If you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com, K-E-E-P-S dot com slash tire to receive your first month of treatment for free. That's keeps.com slash tire to get your first month free. K-E-E-P-S dot com slash tire. We are also brought to you by Policy Genius. Spring is here, everything is blooming, and it is the perfect reminder to get your house in order. I literally have clean the house on my list of things to do when I get home from work today. So why not get a head start to that organization by revisiting your home and auto insurance with Policy Genius? They've saved re-shoppers up to $1,055 per year on their home and auto coverage. It's over $1,000 you could use on one home improvement project you've got your eye on. Here's how you get started. Go to policygenius.com and answer a few questions about yourself and about your property. Then Policy Genius takes it from there. They compare rates from over America's top insurers from Progressive to Allstate to find your lowest quotes. Then Policy Genius team looks at all the ways to maximize your saving, including bundling your home and auto insurance. And if Policy Genius finds a better rate than what you're paying now, they'll switch you over for free. And that kind of service has earned Policy Genius a five-star rating across over thousands of reviews on Trustpilot and Google. So while you're gearing up for that spring cleaning, don't forget to dust off your home and auto insurance insurance policies with Policy Genius. Reshop your rates and you could save up to $1,055. Go to policygenius.com to get started right now. Policy Genius, when it comes to insurance, it's nice to get it right. And of course, car show season is back, everybody. The summer is coming. I can feel it. And the Good Guys Rod and Custom Association is kicking off car season right with its first event of the year at Texas Motor Speedway this coming weekend, March 12th through 14th. The LMC Truck Spring Lone Star Nationals will have over 2,000 classic cars and trucks on display along with an autocross, burn out competition and a vintage dragster exhibition. While Good Guys events welcome American vehicles 1987 or older, late model domestics are welcome to come out on Sunday to show and drive as part of All American Sundays. Tickets are on sale now. Children six and under get in for free with plenty of family friendly activities throughout the weekend. Go to Good dash guys.com to find tickets and get more information about the show. That's good dash guys.com good dash guys.com to get tickets and get more information about the show. This weekend Texas Motor Speedway March 12th to 14th. And lastly we are proud to be brought to you by Tradecraft Farms the official cannabis provider of the Smoke and Tire podcast. Whether it's THC or CBD you're after funky weird cool joints made of gold and roses or all kinds of delightful pen products along with some of the best packaging in the industry. Tradecraft Farms is where it is at, guys. I'm not asking you to start blazing. I'm not asking you to start taking CBD. I'm not even asking you to buy anything. 
all I'm asking you to do with this advertising block right here is give Tradecraft Farms, and that's Tradecraft underscore Farms, a follow on Instagram. Maybe leave a comment on their page and say, Matt Farris sent me. Their Instagram is real, real nice. Their photography is very good. It's a classy joint. It's not going to, like, trash up your feed like some of these other providers I've seen out there. It is not like that. I am all, all, all in on this brand. They've got locations in California. You can check it out one of their retail spots or ask for them at your local dispensary where these things are legal in the civilized world. Tradecraft underscore farms on Instagram. And they are the official cannabis provider of the Smoke and Tire podcast. And I still can't believe I get to say that. All right, folks, it's a crew show today. Me and Zach are uh, back from testing the Bronco Sport. We've tested the Civic Type R Limited Edition. Zach has bought himself a motorcycle, and I don't know what else we're going to be talking about because I'm recording this intro before we even do the show. We'll see. Hello, everybody. We are going to drink whiskey and talk about cars. Get, Indeed. Get Indeed. up in the super chat business if you want to talk about cars with us. Or that's that's not accurate at all. If you want to direct our conversation so that we can talk the, at you. Light, <laughs> <laughs> so we can talk condescendingly at you. Mm. This is good, right? Yeah, this is delicious. This is my this favorite is my favorite drinking whiskey. With that by that I mean not special. Readily available if you know where to find it. Not expensive. 50 bucks a bottle. I mean, that's, you know, it's a sliding scale, but, you right. know, it's drinkable. Yeah, it's good. Taconic it's Distillery. Good. Uh, it's from a unique place, which bourbon. I think is always nice when you're like, oh, this is a special thing. Yeah. That I know of. As far as I know, like, I can only get it in one. I mean, I know they sell it in more than one place, but I've uh, there's only one place that I ever go where I can get it, and that's up by... By Orvis, where I shoot guns. In New York. Where right? I shoot my guns. You might have seen my post on the Gram with my Bremont watch and my shotgun looking like a fucking Orvis ad. The Bremont people really like that Yeah, one. I bet. Mm. But this is the go down. The other, a little more, 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 a little more. Stop when you see, there it is. Stop when you see the watch and the gun. Um, That was a nice trip, that New York trip. Snow. Getting to drive high-performance vehicles on slushy ice tracks, rally stages. That's a quality trip. And also, that watch, that Bremont watch, is right appropriate in the um, in the snow with the guns. Yeah, That was sort much. of the thing, right? The MB2 is a shock-resistant watch. So if you're going to pop off a couple of hundred rounds, right. shock resistance is good. Yeah, you, you had this marriage of winter weather and mm -hmm. uh, expensive precision. <laughs> That's kind of what that trip was about. Indeed. Yeah. Uh, and speaking of winter weather and expensive precision, Zach and I spent all morning with the new uh, Honda Civic Type R Limited Edition. Very nice. It was very nice. It was... That's a Bronco. Didn't I? You did. Didn't I take pictures? Do you need a refresh? Um, there it is. And um, Phoenix Yellow. Fucking yellow. It's very yellow. It's, it's very yellow. yellow. It's yellow with a red... With red seats, for, it's McDonald's. That is interesting. Yeah, the red seats look good inside, but you kind of, like you said, McDonald's. I mean, it's a throwback, but it's a throwback to time when McDonald's right. colors were really fashionable. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> the yellow, if you're going to have a yellow car, I think it's a good one. It's not like, do you remember Sonic Yellow, the Dibber exit? It was like oh, this God. thin No, yellow. no, no, yes. That's but, like that. That's like the pastel yellow, yeah. like Porsche 70s yellow. It looked terrible on the Subaru. It's going to be worth lots of money one day. I don't think so. Nah, the last person, think? yeah, the last stock one of those on Earth, because they could, they didn't even sell that many when they were new, because they were heinous looking. They didn't. Um, but uh, ugh. it's so bad. Sonic, that it's that just yellow thin, is horrible. You know, horrible. it looks like they they only put on the, one actually coat the out most. Of six. That's not even accurate photo. The third row picture on the right, that one. That's actually what it looks like. Right. That's Blaze Yellow. It's is bad. it not? Is it not? Was it Blaze Yellow or Sonic Yellow? Oh, Blaze, oh maybe Sonic was the good yellow. Sonic this... looks different. Yeah, Blaze. No, it's Blaze Yellow. Blaze Yellow. But that's the one you don't want. Or also, some of these also are Sonic Yellow. I don't. It's that fucking pale yellow. No, you're right. It's called Blaze Yellow. Pale yeah. is no good. Anyway, pale yellow is not bar. unless you're driving a 1969 Porsche 911 S. Still not okay. Yeah, it's, it's it's you know. 
Or did, a, did they not make the car in other 50, colors? 55 Thunderbird. Better. Right? But they still made those cars in other colors. You know? <laughs> I know. I know. But sometimes, like, you know, uh, when you're looking for a classic car, beggars can't be choosers. That's true. If I found a fabulous automobile that was in a not great color, I might still fuck with it. That's true. As long as it's not offensive. But mm-hmm. anyway, Civic Type R, very, very, very impressive car. Yeah. Uh, forget the very. color. It's exclusive to the mo- LE, the, the special edition. Um they tweak it. You know, it's one of those like factory specials. And what that special edition STI I drove a couple years ago was it STI? The S209? 209. S209, mm-hmm. that thing. Uh, same kind of thing. Special in a way that only a factory can do because they tweak things that tuner shops wouldn't do. Yeah. It's not just, oh, it's a different shock. And, and wheel and tire combination, although they have that, but it's also like specific points of weight reduction and and specific tuning for the steering and, and shit that you can't really do at a tuner shop. Right, like uh, like when the 2020 came out and they updated the chips that process the suspension, mm-hmm. a shop is probably not going to do that. You know, like they're not going to do right. anything. Or changing the pinion system, pulling out sound yeah. deadening, like... Pulling the wiper off. I mean, you can do that as a shop, but like they're just not going to. And so the, um, it's really like, in the same way that the 911 to GT3, Mustang to GT350 R, you know, and then you've got this. Right. I mean, it's it's it, it it like the GT3 Porsche, and like look what we're we're comparing it in spirit to a hundred and fifty thousand dollar Porsche, seventy thousand dollar Mustang. Um, it's about the connection between the driver and the pavement, and it and it really does feel like the tires have fucking glue on them. Yeah. Uh, and 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 I don't just mean that in terms of grip through a corner. I mean in terms of when you drive a regular Mustang versus a GT three fifty R, a regular Mustang GT. It feels like a bunch of power escapes between the engine and the back of the car and the ground. The GT350R does not. It feels like there's a, a fucking metal connection in between the engine and the ground, and what's in the engine gets to the ground. Yeah, regular GT, it feels like the exhaust takes a vig off the top of horsepower. Right. You know, it has to like take its 10% or 20%, <laughs> and then you're like, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of noise, I'm pressing the gas, this car's a lot of power, but it's just, it's squatting and a lot. And you can it's tell little, it's, it's lost in the gearbox, yeah. or you can tell it's lost in a soft clutch, or it's lost in the motion of the body, because, oh, absolutely. you know, you're, you're the body's rocking back and not moving its inertia forward, that kind of shit. And so this, you know, the Civic Type R and and this edition goes even further uh, because it's hard to tell. Like, neither of us have driven a Civic Type R in two and a half years. Yeah. Maybe even three years. So, like, you know, you can't, you just don't know how much better is this special edition than... That. Than the twenty twenty, the regular twenty twenty, right? Which but, was which was significantly changed from the right the twenty eighteen, right? Yeah. And and so what we do know is they've reduced unsprung weight by twenty two pounds. Mm-hmm. That's good, yeah. and I know what that does to a car. It helps everything. Uh, they've tightened the steering. The steering does feel heavier and tighter. The shifter feels even better than it was before. The shifter was already like perfect, and it's like even better now. Um, and it it feels like there's just no drivetrain loss. You know, if you talk about 300 horse, 306 horsepower in this engine, and maybe that's very underrated. I don't know what these things are dynoing stock, but Ooh, good question. could be underrated. But like, we drove it at 4,000 feet through 3,500 feet, so like, it's not. You know what I mean? Whatever it's underrated, the altitude is going to fucking work Even that it back out. Yeah, yeah. You know, but like compared to the three 350 or whatever you got out of the STI, and even compared to like. The 400 something you get in a Mustang GT or something, it's like this thing gets the power to the ground. Absolutely. Especially above 40 or 50 miles an hour. Well, it, I mean, it beat a lot of the other performance cars in that segment when it first came out in straight line races. Yeah. And I think that really speaks to it. You know, even though the STI had similar horsepower, all wheel drive, it was the Civic, but still beating it to 60 to 100. I mean, yeah. That's really impressive for the motor and for the efficiency of the power. Like when. Misha came in here like uh, the other week and was like, yeah, I'm looking at a fucking, you know, 
Por- a Porsche or whatever, or this, or a CTR, or a CTR and you're kind of like, oh, what are you, a moron? You know, and and I even said to his face, you know, it's like who who does that spread, and you understand how, despite its looks, a more upscale buyer could resonate the the driving experience would resonate with a more upscale buyer. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, especially considering how comfortable, like the seats, I feel like from your, from right below your shoulder blades down, meaning the lower half of your back and your butt, the seats rival any AMG seat. Oh yeah. It's the it's above that cuz what they don't do is they don't come in at the top. So they don't have a good headrest. So if you really want to put your head on the seat, you you're leaning back too far, right? They they don't they've got but having you know this is an I'm nitpicking right now. And if you had a helmet on, you know, if you wanted to have it be helmet ready but you didn't want to make an adjustable headrest, mm-hmm. I understand the the rationale. But from the middle of your back down, the seat is every bit as good as an AMG seat. And that and the really good shock tuning and stuff yeah. and the really good like if you put someone in that seat and put their hands on that wheel and made them had to move that shifter around with the blindfold on and go Honda or Porsche, you'd go what? But I don't act. I'm not really sure. You know, if you close your eyes, like Cayman GT4 shifter and Civic Type R shifter, pretty close. Wow. Different knob shape, but right. D- so throw I- length, weight, uh, pre- precisionness, pretty close. It's know? really, really impressive. It's a really impressive car because I've, you know, when it came out, I, I I put too much weight on my response to the looks. I really didn't like the look of the car, and I put too much weight on that. And then there's an overheating great. issue. And I was like, well, that's a flawed car. It's not a Type R. Da, da, da. Well, this one, they, they've kind of fixed the heating issue. They opened up the front end to make it cool better. They have a NACA duct underneath it and stuff. But just getting in, I mean, I, I only drove this one for, what, like six minutes or something like that. I jumped in, and I felt very comfortable very quickly. Yeah, but you, over, you like, overshot the end of the video. I did You, do like, that. kept driving. Yeah, because I was having fun. I was like, I, I, I honestly didn't even notice I went by the Telluride where we were going to park. I just was, And I was like, it's got to be around the next corner. And then we got to the bridge, and I was like, oh, I've gone way too far. I definitely missed the end of it. But oh, it's, it's a really It's fun to beat on. Car. It's fun to flog around. You know, it's, um, you know... It's it's pretty great at everything. Yeah. Um, What's the ride like on the highway? Fine. You know, it's firm. It's firm, but it's fine. Uh, I've heard from people that have put smaller wheels on it with a little more sidewall that that improves the ride a little bit. Um, and some of the guys who run like Time Attack in these things do that too. Um, it could it, use this because the, the the arches look really really big. Even with this wheel and right. tire setup, it seems like it's got a lot of space. Those are twenties on there. Wow. And considering you know, and they're pretty rubber bandy tires. They're Cup Twos. That's part of the package. Right. You know, we drove it in the in the not the wet but the damp. Yeah. Actually, I mean, I drove it home in the wet. I drove it through a rainstorm on the way home. But in the canyons, it was damp. And I thought the the grip was decent. I mean, it wasn't str- it was definitely struggling for traction if you, you know, you went hammer down in first or second gear. But mm-hmm. in in terms of cornering grip, I thought it was very good. Yeah, I agree. You were mobbing. Yeah, I was. Zach was definitely mobbing. <laughs> I was definitely going for Zach it. Zach was mobbing. I had for no sure. slip issues whatsoever. No, it was good. And was- I was very impressed with uh, how communicative the steering was to your <clears> fingers, like. It's an EPS system. That's a really good. It's very EPS good. System. Yeah, it's very good. And I and and you know we chose a pretty open canyon road. The the tighter the turns, the more you get a torque steer. Mm-hmm. Um, the more open, the less you get it. On race tracks, you barely get it at all. Wow. Race tracks, you know, race tracks. Most race tracks are more open very than flowing, most yeah. most roads. And I mean, I, race tracks. I'm really projecting there. I drove it on Road America, and on Road America, there was no torque steer. That's a very fast track, though. You're up in th- it's third and fourth and fifth gear. Mm-hmm. It's not even really second. But in California, I mean, you know, Button Willow has like that hair. What turn two is really tight. Laguna you'd Seca be in second gear. No, you'd be in second gear ten. in Button Willow. Other and, than and those, Laguna. most of the tracks seem very flowing, just the way they're designed. SoCal tracks are deserts. It's a desert. It's a Chuck desert. Wall is a pretty flowy place. Oh, Chuck Wall. Chuck Wall. This car, you you would not be in second gear anywhere. 
It started. Yeah, it would be, be third. All third, right? Even and at the fourth. end of that, over the hairpin at the end of the um the straight where uh, Harris almost fucking had the guy roll the camera car. Oh yeah, yeah. That corner, I put probably third. Third game. Yeah, probably. It's geared really nice. It is. It's not geared for top end. It's geared for fucking nicey enjoyment gear. Yeah, it and feels like you, it's not geared for MPG aggressively. You know, so mm -hmm. many cars you drive, and you're like, I know why they did this, mm -hmm. but I have to tell myself that, otherwise I'm going to get upset. This thing, it's nice. If you're going 80 on the high, and it's easy, you drive, you drive like a dick bag in this car, and you know when you you in, you don't have to downshift. You know, you're 70 to 80, you're right at that torque build where you can make nice passes on the on the torque wave, and it's yeah. very fun. It's a good engine. It's mm -hmm. a real good engine. And it makes a very interesting sound. Do they pump it in the car a bit? They do. They pump it in the car, yeah. right? Yeah. Whatever, I find the noise that comes out of it to be very pleasant. Real it was or weird. fake you say, like, or small whatever. Turbine? It's got a, I mean, this is going to sound incredibly complimentary, but it gave me... Uh, uh, echoes of the roof yellow bird in terms of being like a smooth turbine. Mm, yeah. Interesting. Because the yellow bird sounded different inside than outside, mm -hmm. you said, right? I know you can't talk outside, about it too much. I just I was there yeah. when you drove away, right? And it sounded like kind of any other Porsche with a little bit. I mean, of yeah, on the sound, inside, but, it's very different. I yeah. describe this in as best detail as I can in my new show I'll on Haggerty. Yeah. Um, but. So here's, you know, the, 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 of course, the biggest problem with this Civic Type R limited edition is twofold. One, there's no reason this has to be the limited edition. This could just be the car. Nothing about this. I mean, even if the lightweight wheels cost more, like there could be optional lightweight wheels. You know what I mean? Like, like, like I think they could like cuz the dealers are going to fuck this up. If you go back and look at my Instagram post and lots of people DM'd me as well. And please if you're listening now, don't continue to DM me. I don't need further evidence of the ADM, which is additional dealer markup. So, the sticker on the Civic Type R limited edition is $45,000. So it's an $8,000 premium over the regular one. Is that worthwhile sticker for sticker? Maybe. Because the wheel and tire package is probably six by itself. Yeah. You know what I mean? You want 20-inch 20, really 20 BBS yeah. forged wheels, powder coat black, With plus Pilot Sport Cup 2 tires on them. That That's six grand, right? And so, and the other the other upgrades are worthwhile, right? I, they, I mean, they don't make the car worse. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, like, they took the sound deadening and shit out. Like, they should just all be that. It's the type R. Why, like, it's not offensively loud right the way it is. It sounds nice. Like, leave the fucking sound deadening out. Who mm -hmm. I don't need my type R to have extra sound deadening in it at all. That's leave true. Leave that shit out. You and know it was only mean? 25 pounds, right? I wonder. Yeah. I'd be curious how many decibels it, it, it raised. Uh, or it, it increased after they took the sound. Like, was it two? I don't was know. it 10? Yeah, I'm I don't know. Curious. I found, but I found the... I found the sound on the highway coming into the cabin to be quite pleasant. I wasn't like, oh, this is like, oh, you know what I mean? It's not even, it wasn't even aggressive like a GT3 RS would be. It was like, no. it turbo was pretty like regular car. You turbo know? 4 with rear exhaust, like they can't be that loud these days. They but just because can't. they're only making 600 for the US, the dealers are going to fuck this up. And if you go back to my Instagram post, you see people commenting over and over and over about what is what they're charging look honda of westminster wants 100k <gasps> for theirs there's uh, there's so what? many dude there's so many they're in like the 70 in the high 60s 70k i mean you know there's there's a lot of people that were commenting about the adm they were seeing uh locally and people sending grand. yeah and so as i'm saying in the video if you start having to pay those types of prices for this car, it very quickly becomes not worthwhile. Of course, because then you're you're competing with other brands, other experiences, other sounds, other engines, all these things. Not and, just you know. rear drive cars, but mid engine rear drive cars. Now, mm -hmm. you know what I mean. You're you're up in not just second hand Porsche territory. You're <laughs> you're up in new Porsche territory. Right. You know. You're in really nicely specced Cayman right. S territory. And quite frankly, the Honda rep. That contacted me about the the briefing me on this car before before we drove it. They even were as so presumptuous in the email as to say we expect buyers of this vehicle to be high end collectors and track day enthusiasts. 
and it just is like it doesn't need to be that. Like, are are they taking a loss building these things? Like, I can't imagine that selling a forty five thousand dollars Civic somehow they're taking a loss, right? So that now they got to go even further and like limit it so that the dealers are going to get their 15K ADM and go buy a new fucking snub nose pontoon boat or some, you know, some <laughs> terrible toy, you know, or some tasteless thing. And like, do you think it's just, you know, nostalgia is more powerful than ever? The type R name is gotten more and more expensive. I think the gen the, the the ninety late eighties and nineties cars are obviously getting super expensive. Right. You know, S two thousand everything are selling for tons and tons of money. I think they did the math. Yeah. I think they went, okay, who has bought these cars for the first three years? And they have found that the average type R customer and I'm hypo I'm guessing, but someone please tell me if I'm wrong, because I don't think I am. I really don't. I'm happy to be told wrong if I am. I'm betting that the average type R customer has two or three times the net worth of the average Honda buyer. Uh, Not the everybody. Average Civic buyer or Honda average buyer. Average Civic buyer. Average Civic buyer. Or you can extend it to the rest of the brand. They don't make. They don't make things that are that expensive. Most expensive things probably like an Odyssey. Right. Yeah. But like. I think people they they got a lot of ADM on the first round of Civics, and I think they of Type R's, and I think they continue to be bought by relatively wealthy people mm. compared to the type of people a that buy regular Civics and b oh, the type of people that buy STIs. Well, because the price difference between I mean the Civic SI that I tested a few years ago I think was like twenty five thousand mm -hmm. dollars or something like that it was an amazing mm -hmm. bargain, really good car. So this list is twenty more than that, and the regular like Civic's a nice car for what it is. Nice like even yeah. the Touring or whatever, like was really nice. Like, yeah, it's quick, handles but, well. Uh, da, da, da. I think they, I think they see an opportunity for a nostalgia-driven cash grab, uh, and not only a cash grab at the corporate level. I mean a cash grab, a handout to the dealers. You know what I mean? A free, a free little handout to the dealers. Here's something you can. It's fucking yellow. Put it in a showroom, put a spotlight on it, and say, plus 30 ADM. Well, I mean, how long were they going to watch Porsche do this, right? <laughs> All the car companies yeah. watch it, and they're like, that's a great idea. What, yeah. what do we have that can do that? And as soon as Type R's hit the bring a trailer market, as soon as people... Because they're very good cars, you know. All, right. the, all the Type R's have been really good cars that were almost underappreciated in their time, and then dropped for a long time. And so they look at that and like, well, why can't we do the same game? Of course, yeah. But it's it is it's unfortunate, unfortunate. Yeah. because I think that that they could sell a lot of these. They could drive a lot of enthusiasm. I don't think they need to sell so many that they devalue the product. I mean, how many could that be? You know, right? Um, but. They're selling just few enough that they're that people are going to get raked over the coals for them at the mm -hmm. at the dealer level, and that sucks. You know that sucks. That I wonder if there is a. By the way, if the model to come back to this, the model, if you want to look at 2016, 17 GT 350R, right, mm -hmm. 20 to 40 ADM on these cars, right. You look at them now on bring a trailer on cars and bids on whatever, and. They are that money was wasted. That was burned money. They don't, right. I mean, they held their value well. If you bought one for sticker and put a couple of thousand miles on it, they were cheap miles. Mm -hmm. But if you paid 80 or 90 thousand dollars for one to be the first guy to have one, guess what? Ain't nobody giving a fuck now, right? Burned money. It's, it's like, uh, you know, things come onto IPO and they immediately drop by 40 percent, mm -hmm. you know, because early investors. Get to like make their money and, and sell it to us. So, yeah. So you, if you're the person that spent eighty grand on a GT350, you're that person, and all of a sudden it drops. You're like, but I thought this was going to be worth two hundred grand. You're like it will in fifty years. <laughs> so the, I, I wonder. It has to go through the minimum cool first. I yeah. wonder if Honda's playing this game, and a lot of them are, where they go, if we make this in limited numbers, you know, it has all these accolades. It's very fast. It's a very good car. In 30 years, when people start talking about them again, you know, they bought them out, they go back up, everyone goes, remember how good that was? If that will serve them as advertising for the next You think thing. they're playing a 30-year long game with this car? 40 chess. I don't, I don't, Mark. <laughs> 40 chess. I think uh, that maybe they should read the Warren Mosler, <laughs> Seven Deadly Innocent Frauds of Economic Policy. Shout out to David, a fan who sent us 
Warren Mosler of Mosler Supercars apparently wrote a book about economics, and he sent us some copies. Um, I mentioned briefly uh, cars and bids. I wanted to, mm. to jump to that real quick. I think we've covered the Civic Type R, except for what uh, what we say in our video, obviously. Which it's is, a phenomenal Just the same thing we just said here, except at yeah. speed. <laughs> right, yeah. It's a really impressive car. Um, I am listing a Volkswagen Golf R for one of my clients. On cars and bids right now, uh, go to scroll down, Zach. Let's find the listing. It's a blue Golf R, and the photos are inside WCCS, so it's very easy to spot. There it is on the right. Go back up on the right. There, 20, 2019 oh. Golf R. Um, it's a really nice car, ten thousand mile car. It's a stick. It has a couple choice suspension mods, and it has a uh, a bolt on downpipe and a stage one tune and lightweight wheels and Pilot Sport Cup 2 tires with plenty of tread. It had a service yesterday. These are such good cars. Really nice cars. These are such good cars. Yeah, and it's a good client of mine. He's got a really nice collection, and this was his daily driver, and it's a very, very clean car. It is available for viewing. It's uh, at auction March 10th to 17th. No reserve. It will sell. Um, and it's available for viewing at WCCS. Uh, and that also just I wanted to bring up that I found the um, process of selling or of submitting anyway to cars and bids to be very slick. Uh, the interface is very good. The website works well. It's just a click one step to the next process. And uh, I worked with Tyler and Ryan. Uh, Tyler's their head of auctions, and Ryan is one of their auction writers, and they were very prompt. They uh, did a really nice job translating my, you know, you fill out a form. You know, it's a basic okay. form, and filled out stuff and about about the car, and they did a nice job writing it up. I took the photos, and um, yeah, if anyone wants to buy, like, a really nice, clean, low-mileage, two-year-old golf car, uh, it's a Let's stick. Let's see what Doug's take. Doug's take is, this is a fantastically gorgeous Golf R in the right spec you want, the best exterior color, lapis blue, with the six-speed manual. This R also touts some great, tasteful mods that improve the driving experience and the look, and this car boasts relatively low mileage, an accident-free history port, a short lifetime in California, and one owner history, offered with the thrill of no reserve. Yeah. Yeah. Doug is Doug wrote a nice little little bit there for it. All of those things great. are true. Yeah, one owner, no accidents, very clean, fresh service, California car. It's been here for the last six months. Wow. So like 2019 means it was driven, you know, for 18 months and then put here. Right. So yeah. anyway, um, that's the plug. It's a uh, I you know, I don't get a cut. I get a flat. I actually did this for this is a flat fee we do at WCCS. Flat photo detail car sale prep fee. It's a good deal. The whole thing. Yeah. You do the whole shit. And I don't take a cut. It just I like doing no reserve. I like to let it let it fly. Cause it's the market right. will decide. That's true. Dude, if if mentally I tell a lot of people this, they because they talk about reserve and shit, and I'm like, if mentally the car's gone for you, you have decided you you've mentally moved on from this car, let it fly. No reserve. I think I mean, you unless you're upside down too. on it, right? That's you know, the if, thing. People if you're are always like, "I gotta make this." Much well, if better. you're upside down on it, you know, maybe you fucked up a little bit, also. Or if your spouse is like, "You spend how much on this? You better get that back." One of those things. Yeah, I mean, look, if you fucked up, I can't help you. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great, get that on a plaque in the business. Hey, yeah, but I need to make twenty-seven grand. Well, I I can't help the fact that you fucked up buying this car. Uh, you know, that's sorry. a funny car to show to new, to new customers. By the way, if you fucked up, I can't help you. <laughs> That's like that's like my version of bar rescue. It's like I should do, you know, I should I should I remember when I wanted to do car rescue? Mm -hmm. Car rescue would be funny. We just take people with the horrible mods and then fix them <laughs> fix them. Just take their wheels off, put new, put stock wheels back on. Yeah, I mean, you literally would flag people down on the street that just had terrible mods and be like, "Look, this could be done better." That would be so <laughs> let, fun. Let me help you. And just replace it with stock parts and they go, "What are you doing?" Be like, "This is so much I better. You have no it. idea why." Oh my god. Have you ever put a car back to stock? And then uh, driven it? I've never modified anything so heavily that I had to do that. Yeah, no. I I didn't go all the way back to stock, but when I had my Mini, one of the things I did with my Mini was I removed the rear seat. 
Um, now, minis are amazing for tall people in the front seat. You can move the yeah. seat fucking way far back. Like, you can feel like a six foot eight dude in a mini, especially an R53, first gen, uh, modern first gen, right? Uh, but so, what I was like, here's a plan. I didn't like having people sit behind me in the mini. I like wasn't about it. it just wasn't. That's so where threats come from. So I I did the rear seat delete kit. So you get rid of the rear seat, and it was kind of he- I was shocked at how heavy it was. It Is was, it a kit, or you just take the seat out? Well, you take the seat out, and then it was this sort of like c- c- cut to fit carpeting that you put over because it's bare metal. Right. Otherwise, you're seeing like it those wasn't. It wasn't. Uh, okay. It wasn't something nice like Gunther or Singer, you know, does. It was. It was carpet. Right. Basically. Well, that would cost more than the mini. And and it you know you don't really think about the seat. It got loud. You know it got loud in there. Even with the carpet, it got fucking loud. And at first I was like, yeah, race car, this thing's loud. You know what I mean? And then when I went to sell the car, I put the back seat back in it. And the the loud, it's still the exhaust was still there. That it still sounded nice, but that just noise yeah. went away. And I went. Oh, I fucked up. I fucked up by taking the seat out of this. <laughs> people, people have told me to take the seat out of my BMW because no one's ever sat back there, literally. But every time I put the seats down, just down, I go, that is so much louder than I wanted to Yeah, do you don't want to hear into no. your trunk. Yeah, exactly. <coughs> you don't want to know what's back there. People one of the scream things back in... there. People are trying to get out. No. <laughs> one of the things in the... <laughs> that was buried. The lead was yeah. buried there. One of the things in the Civic Type R they reduce is the, the, the parcel shelf. In yeah, the, in the hatch, they, they, they took get, it out, right? They get rid of the hat, that part. It's way too much. I feel like they were fifty. I mean, the car Dude, is like the car is maybe three thousand pounds, pounds, right? The car is three thousand fifty pounds. Yeah. So they took out fifty. If you tell me it's thirty one hundred, I'm still impressed. You know, it. I mean, look, you got to take it out where you got to take it out. When I was when I was driving with uh, Jamie, the Bugatti guy, mm-hmm. you know, I go, I go, Jamie, let's get level with me. I go, this car is forty five hundred pounds. Am I supposed to be impressed by 110 pounds of weight reduction? He goes, yeah, because there's so many things you just can't make any lighter. Mm. He said, you you cannot make the engine and the gearbox. You know what I mean? He's like, right. he's like the fucking chassis of this thing is a carbon tub made by Delara. Wow. He's like, you, you, the, you, all you have to cut is superfluous shit. True. Because even at 4,500 pounds, they've already done all this like weight reduction. I guess it's it's not like, I'm curious if if you drove if you took a Honda Civic Type R LE to a track and you put a 50 pound weight in it somewhere. I wonder what the time difference would be because I think so, so many of the changes came from. So if I drove it versus from, you drove it. <laughs> yeah, actually, that's a good point. I mean, you're a better driver than me, but yes, because you know you had these really good tires, they upgraded the suspension, yeah. like they changed a lot of like fundamental things that make cars go faster. Mm-hmm. But 50 pounds is such a small number to me. That's what I, you know, when they cut 200, uh, yeah. I'm impressed. Yeah, it, it becomes uh, how do you, it becomes less than you can feel. Yeah, but it. And what you, do you know, have to, what do you have to sacrifice? I think is usually the question. In this case, in this case, nothing. Rear really. Viper, who, you know, you can live without that. You can't leave your laptop time. in the trunk anymore. Yeah, it, you can see like now. You can just see right in it. True. But that's. I mean, that's it. Really, everything else is like still good. Yeah, very comfortable um, car. Big spacious car. Yeah, and that that's too. I mean, that too. It's still a big spacious For car. For how fast yeah. it is, there's not a lot of compromise. Yeah. Um, we also took a Bronco off roading. We did. <clears throat> and the video went up today. The Bronco, not a Bronco, Bronco Sport, excuse me. Bronco Sport. Um, uh, someone pointed out in the comments, Zach, and this could just be someone being a, you know, commenter. But someone pointed out that we're always impressed when SUVs make it up this trail that we use. Mm-hmm. And yet they all do. We We've never tried to go up this and then failed and i think that's because if we don't think it will do it we don't even try because we don't it's not our goal to break it or be stranded on the side of a mountain all day right but is this trail easier than we think it is uh i think it is it's pretty much the hardest trail in the park uh no well there's one there's one trail that goes straight up the the one that goes the other side the one, we we approached one trail that with a Grand Cherokee, and we looked at it, and we were like, we're not doing this. Cause yeah, the, yeah, from the other side. The other side. Yeah, And then there's yeah. the trail from the front side that we looked up, and I and we both said, I don't even know what goes up that. And it's like double black diamond, 
a ranger once told me that like a jeep got stuck up there so i think what what we're doing is we're going up a trail that is difficult for us that you can do without having spotters or a support vehicle because we don't have those options a lot of times yeah i mean i think this is the tough thing about off-roading and and i want to i'm saying this in the context of the fact that the bronco sport for what it is is a fucking fabulous off-road vehicle i mean for 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 where it started and how much it costs it's really very impressive what it can do and where it can go but it's really very hard to make a video that looks impressive off-roading mm-hmm. a cuz yeah. cuz your video cameras don't really show the uh, the steepness right um and they don't really show the terrain that well and also there's almost nothing you can do south of fucking sending it and breaking something you know uh that would really impress off-road fans uh like we can't i can't we I can't know. off-road in a bronco sport in a way that would impress someone who's like into super hardcore off-roading. I mean, if we were getting wheels off the ground while we were going slowly, maybe that would impress them, but uh, off-roading is hard because it the videos don't translate. You know, Most of our audience likes speed, and I think most people in general, speed is a more relatable thing yeah. in terms of danger and difficulty <clears throat> than going very slowly and being very careful. The trail might, we may just be learning, like this trail is too easy for modern SUVs because of modern traction systems, electronics, diffs, and everything else. I yeah. definitely wouldn't say it's an easy trail. The easy trail is the fire road that goes up to the top from the other right. side. Like there are places on this trail that if you don't place your tire in the right place, you could tip over. You'll definitely scrape the bottom of it or damage something. Like you have to be mindful about what you're doing. Um, but I think if you have decent ground clearance and decent electronics and mechanical hardware, like most things now will make it up that trail. Right. Like, do you think like a fucking like RAV4 would make it up that trail? I think the RAV4 Adventure would. But it's built very similarly to the Bronco yeah. in terms of what the four-wheel drive system is. I think a straight front-wheel drive car would probably struggle to get up that because once you start going up some of the sandy parts, no, the you goes to the back, need like, four-wheel drive. No, you need four-wheel right. drive for um, sure. In the mm-hmm. right conditions, maybe a rear-wheel drive vehicle only might make it up with enough grip. But it's it's not hard. It's not difficult for hardcore off-roader people for sure. No, and it's not. And we've seen other people go up it in other trucks. Yeah. And it and like, you know. And I, I'm not trying to – overall, we were impressed, right? And overall, I think most people who watch the video are impressed. And I'm not trying to focus on one negative commenter or two negative commenters. But I'm just really trying to to figure out and sort of think through, you know, is like – like I, I chose that trail – because I thought it's harder than anyone who buys a fucking Bronco Sport would ever do. Like, right. I, you're, no one is going. Like, the, like you said, the fire road. Like to get to the base of that trail where we start those videos, those off road videos, is about a what a thirty minute transit on a fire road. Yeah, it's fucking. It's a far fire road, and it's not just. A dirt road. It's le- pretty level off roading. You're going through and over rocks and, and around. And so I think most people who buy this thing are pretty much just doing the fire road. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. Or, I or think... the basics or driving on a beach to yeah. go surfing or right. like your basic kind of camping stuff, dirt roads. I think our goal is one, to not break things, not hurt ourselves, not hurt the vehicles, but also. Can this do something that is far more difficult than your average consumer or most people that buy these vehicles will do? Because it, in my head, it's shown me here's what those things are actually capable of. Mm-hmm. So if you own one of these things and you get in a situation where you're like, oh, my God, is this going to be too difficult for us? We're trying to get to this cabin or something like you'll probably be fine unless you end up on something that's the Rubicon that requires lots of ground clearance. I would like to learn serious off-roading and rock crawling, but I want to do it with something like a Wrangler that has, or, you know, the new Bronco that has a lift and correct tires and a spotter or a support vehicle. Like, cause yeah. that, that might inform us. We should do that because that would inform us, you know, we'll raise the bar of what's difficult for us. I've done some of that. I mean, I haven't done some big buggy, right? But I went out with Tim in his forerunner when it had the mm-hmm. bigger lift than it has now. And we had spotters and I, I, <laughs> I learned that I didn't really enjoy it so much. I mean, Everything's fine, and then you get stuck on one rock, and you're there for fucking, like, two hours dealing with this bullshit. Yeah, it's the most stress you can have at two miles an hour other yeah. than being on the Titanic as it sinks. Yeah. I mean, I think I think the trail doesn't really translate mm-hmm. uh, to video. I think that 
the like you said, the modern vehicles are really a lot more capable than most people think they are. Um, and that and all, is and all, actually sorry. Yeah, go, no, no, nothing. And, that that's what I think is actually really interesting is that I think there's a lot of people that get pulled towards Wrangler, Tacoma, things that are expensive and look really capable because they think they need it to do some of the things we've done in these lesser quote lesser vehicles. Yeah, like I took a base Velar. Right. You know, granted it had air suspension and that helped because it gave us some ground clearance, but like a Velar on 18s, you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. was it was it was not really a problem either. It fucking did it, you know. That's um, what was fun about doing that drive trip with, you know, you Spinelli and Harris and Spinelli had the Renegade and yeah. we're on this trail that was not, I think in in some places gnarlier than the one we've been doing. And yeah, because it had some boulders. Yeah, it had some yeah. like serious basketball-sized rocks. Yeah, and we had to be very careful with where the vehicles went. But we're passing other jeeps and lifted vehicles, and they're kind of looking at me like, "What are you doing here?" And then you know he makes it. The so. Renegade did it. Yeah, it did do it. Yeah, and the fucking you know the Compass and the Patriot were actually quite good off-roaders right. too. It's they're all just the same. Ugly yeah. and crappy, but they yes. but they could get up a trail. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> but. The Bronco was the first, uh, or Bronco Sport was the, like I said in the video, uh, first transverse engine uh, vehicle we've ever taken up that trail. Mm -hmm. So it was the first vehicle with like a Haldex type all wheel drive system and not true, you know, rear drive based, locking diff based, because even the Velar does have those things because it is is a Range Rover. Right. Um, And I don't know. I mean, I guess we could probably try to find a, find a harder trail, but. I think that trail's a good benchmark because, like, actually, you know, there's the people who think that they could get a regular car up that trail. That the first eighth of a mile, you're not getting a fucking car up it. You're yeah. just not. Yeah, like, there's not. definitely sections of the trail where, yeah, you could drive a car up that. Absolutely. The whole trail is not that hard. But where you, if you watch the video, you know, we drop down this narrow thing and then go straight up for about 100 yards. Mm-hmm. I tried to do it. Remember the, I don't know if you remember this, but I went out there with the Velar and the Macan S. And the oh, Macan right. S made it about nine feet yeah. up that trail on 19-inch wheels and snow tires. And the Macan was like, oh, fuck to the no, and just shut down, and we had to reverse it out of That's there. That's right. And we abandoned. There, right? We abandoned. Yeah. And then we went up the trail in the Velar. The most challenging part of that trail is that first section, yeah. I think, unless you choose a difficult line, you know, mm-hmm. and other parts on the way up. Because the that first part... I tried to look at it on Google Earth. I was thinking of dropping the screen grabbing with 3D. It doesn't show how steep it is and how narrow that part is because to the left of it is a hole. Like I stood in it once. We did a video yeah, it's and a I car stood in it. sized it's seriously hole. this high. <laughs> yeah. from, from the shelf we're on he to was, the he, bottom of the hole. He did a hand on a chest. Is like there for chest the high. People, yeah. And if your car is too wide or if you don't stick far enough to the right side, like you could tip into that hole and have a very bad day. Yeah. And it's, it's also really steep and it's dirt there. So it's, it's, it's not the grippy rocks that there are in the other sections. And you can't and come if, into once it. Once you ton drive momentum. around the hole, you then are looking at the sky. Yeah, very true. <laughs> and, yeah, exactly. And you're not really sure what's up at the top of that, but you have yeah. to accelerate hard. <laughs> I mean, we've made, what, two movies driving normal cars over lots of terrain, and I don't think – I think the Previa might have made it up over that hole with momentum only because it's mid-engine in real drive, but only with a lot of momentum. You know, shit boxes are different. Yeah. If you're willing to just smash the chassis on the ground – right. That's a whole other story. Yeah, you get up a lot of things if you're willing to completely wreck the vehicle in the process. But you don't have great run up there. Like it's not like a flat oh, there's no road inertia. where you get no, 60 no, no, miles no, an yeah. hour and then rock it up it. So mm-hmm. I think that's really. I think what we sh- we should get, you know, Wrangler when the new Bronco comes out, or we should get something that is hardcore. You know, well, and let's go take it to a more difficult place and and just learn and see what that's like. Yeah. I mean, that's doable. We can find a harder trail. We can go up that, that fucking nasty thing. one. Right. I've been down that, but years ago, and the weather has not been kind to it. Right, it's yeah. Made it, it's made it harder. It, it's a, a run, Water runs right down, and it's like a fucking little Grand Canyon forming over there. We should see. Um, if it'd be cool if we go to, like, uh, G- Easter Jeep Safari in Moab. I want to do, do fucking 
the Southern California, the, the, the Colorado and the SoCal backcountry discovery routes so fucking badly. And I don't want, I just want to do them in something reliable, comfortable, where we can enjoy them and mm. just cru- and cruise, camp a little bit, hotel a little bit, you know, get really get those campsites going. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, there's a, um, uh, a site's called, uh, the website is Ride bdr.com and uh it's it's done by butler right doesn't butler own this company it's basically uh ways uh to cross entire states not entirely off-road but with a maximum of Mm off-road and um there's a bunch of different states they have maps for and you get the paper map or you could download plot points uh, that work on a, a GPS, a tablet or phone GPS. And um, we've done the Washington and the Utah ones. They're both fabulous. They move, We made movies. All Cars Go to Heaven 1 and 2. And um, while we'd like to make a movie again, I don't really care that much about the movie portion of it as much as I do about the, the drive was so good. Yeah, really um, one of the best. Because you're just seeing shit that the road doesn't see. The regular road. I mean, even mm-hmm. driving around these states, the roads are nice and whatever, but but you can't see this kind of shit from the road. because well, most roads go between mountains. Right, <clears> right. I mean, they go over them when they have to, but the BDR route, I mean, it looked like a heart rate monitor because when we looked at the map for the day, <clears throat> it shows you, because it's meant for motorcycles. That's who it was first designed for. Right. And motorcycles have to fuel up more, more than cars. So you're looking at this map from the side and it just looks like up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Here's your fueling station. So we were crossing multiple mountains per day and we were near the summits of them. Yeah. You know, seven, eight, 9,000 feet on dirt. That's over true. Over logging roads and stuff like that. And the highways we would drop down to, they were driving between the, the mountains, going around them for most part. That's and true. And you were driving over them. Yeah, we were seeing the Purple Mountains from the top in Washington. Ooh, that was the shit. It's amazing. Yeah. And so we did Washington, which was incredible. And we did Utah, which was incredible. Uh, neither, b- uh, both did not disappoint. No. Um, and so the one we've got up on the screen right now is the Southern California one, which is a new one. California is so big, they've broken it into two. And they haven't actually released the Northern California yet. But the Southern California starts at the southeastern corner, uh, at the intersect, the corner of, of California, Mexico, and Arizona. And it works its way up. You know, everyone focuses on the coast in California, mm-hmm. right? It's all about the coast, the coast, the coast. And I get it. Coast is nice. Every be- the beach is the easy way. But this one focuses on the eastern side of the state, right along the California-Arizona border, and then up the California-Nevada border, and up the eastern Sierras, which most people don't even fucking really know about the eastern right. Sierras and how dope they are. But, like... Riding over the Eastern Sierras is would be the sh- dopest shit ever. Yeah, and so you'd want to do the SoCal one in the winter, and then we want to do the Co- the Colorado one in the summer, which goes to like eleven thousand, twelve thousand feet. What's nice about the Eastern Sierras versus the Western Sierras is the Western Sierras, when you look west, you see stuff. You see more. There's more developed land near the coast between you. I mean, that's where you have a lot of the cities that develop between it. But when you look at the eastern side. You can see like Death Valley, yeah, in, in the starting mountain ridge of Death Valley. It's like you're in this crazy desert valley between those two mountain ranges, and it just feels—I don't know—it feels a little more special, a little more empty. It's pretty undeveloped by comparison. Yeah, I really want to do like—I mean, I want to do you know Bronco Defender Wrangler, yeah, you know, and really fucking do it. I don't know if they'll if they'll let us do that. I, I hope highly they- recommend everyone do a trip like this. Then they have. They're de- they're starting to have. I think they have the one Wyoming, East Coast route. Utah, Nevada, uh, Northeast, Southern California, Idaho, Colorado, Mid Atlantic. The Mid Atlantic one is like Blue Ridge Parkway area. It's like Ooh. Great Smoky Mountains. Wow. That one looks ridiculous. Uh, Washington, uh, Arizona, and New Mexico. Yeah, looks fucking yeah. sick. Right? I think uh, what you're saying is the the need, the need or the want to do a trip like that is surpassing the time you're willing to wait to do a movie about it. Because if we want to do a movie, we need to get funding and stuff. It's like, no, we yeah. just want to do it. You don't want to wait a year or two to try and find partnerships to do these things. Yeah, just and make, I don't, like, and do like, it. you know, if you're not going to do it right, filming is great when you're doing it right, and it's horrible when you're not. Yeah. If you have to cut corners, if you have to be the host and the, the star and the cameraman, also, it's terrible. Mm-hmm. It, I, it really is. It's not worth it, and especially because this the trip itself 
is is cheap. It's yeah. a car, a tent, and gas. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, and whatever else you want to bring. It's the filming that is expensive and the production of the, of, a, of a movie. A, 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 a capable vehicle, gas for a week, and food in a tent is is not that big of a deal. It'd be nice to experience it without having to worry about what content we're getting. Also, right. you just you know you have a different brain when you're doing that. We would just you just chill. Look at that. It's a thing. Look, look at that. Isn't that nice to look at? We oh, should stop gorgeous. and look at that. Yeah. Huh? There it is. Okay. What do you want to say about that thing, Matt? <laughs> Nothing. I'm just gonna look at that. Just look at this tree. That's yeah, all I'm doing. That's it. Just that. Um. What else is happening? Is there things that were, uh, oh, well, they just dropped off a Ducati, so we're back at the motorcycle review game for next week. They dropped off the Ducati Multistrada V4. I've not ridden it yet, but it is a really pretty bike. It has a lot of technology. It has adaptive cruise control. It has a self-leveling adaptive suspension. I'm not really sure these are things I want, but it has it. That's it. It's a, I wow. mean, it's a Ducati. It's a Ducati Adventure Touring bike. So this is their BMW GS competitor, Correct. basically? Correct. Okay. Yes. So, yeah, expensive, go anywhere kind of thing. Yeah. Wow. But it sounds, we, I can't wait to hear it downstairs, for real. I'm ex- like, It sounds Ducati very nice. Sound amazing. It has keyless start. I mean, it's like a whole fucking- It's it has got, keyless start. It has keyless start. You park it in neutral, I assume. You park it in neutral. Wait, is it automatic transmission? No. Okay. No. It's, so you park it in neutral, leave it. It's not keyless, keyless start. start like remote start. Oh, it's like you get on it and you press the thing. You just don't have to up. put the key in the thing. It Got has it. like a, a fob. That makes more sense. Yeah. I'm I'm pretty excited, actually. It's I'm not going to ride it off-road. I'm a huge pussy. I don't want to break myself. I'm very – I'm really – I'm nervous about that. I uh, – yeah, I get it. I – like I want you to off road, and then when you were like, "Well, if I fall off, things get really hurt." I'm like, "That's a very good point." Yeah, you're totally accurate. I could really fuck myself up yeah. having like we just saw. So we're we're there, we're at the bottom of this trail yesterday, mm. and we're <laughs> right. We're putting cameras on the not yesterday, two days ago. It's fuck, that was yesterday. Yesterday, God, the time yeah. goes by weird. The time goes by weird as fuck, doesn't it? A lot of cars this week. We did a lot, a lot, of, a lot of vehicles this week. A lot yeah. of things going on. Okay, so we're at the bottom of this hill. We're setting up cameras and these two kids on you know little 125s or 250s like dirt bikes go by and they go up the trail that we're going to go up and one of them goes in the goes with his dirt bike into the giant hole that Zach's talking about and he fucking dumps his bike and like falls over and and where we're staged we can see the hole it's like the a direct line of sight to the hole and so this kid dumps his bike in the hole and I can see him fall over. I go, you see this? I go, Zach, this fucking kid. I go, that would be me, and I that and I would need to be airlifted. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, and he was. It was funny because he was just trying to like he was pushing the bike, revving it, you know, trying to help it get up the hill. The hill's really steep; it's really slippery, and he keeps slipping backwards. And it, Matt's like, "That looks terrible," and I go, "That looks fun." <laughs> but yeah. he might. He was there for a, a minute while his friend, meanwhile, was like two hills beyond and had no idea what was going on behind yeah. him. Yeah. Yeah. Meanwhile, you bought a motorcycle from Musto that is a, a cheap enduro bike. It's the cheap version of this Multistrada V4. Very cheap. Very cheap. Like $2,000 cheap. Yes, correct. And what's uh, it called? It's a uh, Bagheera uh, MZ660. That sounds and like a gun. It does sound like a gun, <laughs> and it's probably made by people that also make guns. Yeah. Um, and so what's great is Zach wanted a bug out vehicle. Correct. And uh, and he's and so he's got. I don't know why he wanted a bug out vehicle. Why did you want a bug out vehicle? I uh, I don't know. Last year I was just you know everything was getting really weird around here, and nas- I just it was definitely a bit of an impulse buy and a bit of a I'm worried buy. But once I saw National Guard helicopters flying around Los Angeles, I went okay, and it just made me think if there's ever a really big earthquake here, if there's ever something. Everyone's going to try to leave. Yeah. And the highways here are already clogged. And yeah. Like, the only way you're leaving this city is by two, air, two wheels. two wheels, or by sea. Yeah. And uh, I don't know. It was, a, it was, a, it's definitely, maybe it's a stupid thing, but for the amount of money I spent, which is, again, $2,000, I was like, I just want a dual sport motorcycle that I can just ride up the side of the highway and just leave if everything right. falls apart. And if you have a which work, you will. if the world doesn't go that way, then you have you, a motorcycle. 
Well, and you have you can always get two thousand dollars back for that. Right. It's part. I mean, it's not. It it's, came out in two thousand two. Yeah. Musto bought it. He refurbished some a, stuff. Oh, that's what it uh, looks like. It looks exactly like this. Oh, awesome! Oh, you know what the be the best news is? I'll be riding that. Right. <laughs> You know? That bike needs to be kept alive and ready for the apocalypse. And it yeah, yeah. Well, you I need to be exercising. Yeah, yeah, you can exercise. So it's a it's a six sixty single cylinder. The engine's built by Yamaha. It's a parts bin thing. You know, they have their story of like the company's been alive for a hundred years, right. but it's made wherever it's made. So the brakes are Spanish. The engine's Japanese. The good thing is I can service well, yeah, Civic it Type wherever. R though, dude. The engine is made in America. The transmission is made in Japan. And the final assembly of the Civic Type R is in England. Which I was not expecting yeah. when I heard that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a lot of shipping going on to make That's that a car. a lot of shipping, right? Yeah. Global economy. But yeah, I, I truly just wanted something that was sitting around in case, I don't know, in case there's an earthquake and everyone wants to leave here. And, I don't um, think it's a totally un irrational thought. I mean, I have thought about the tsunami taking my entire house out, right. which would happen. Yeah, um, it would. You know, and I've thought, and for me, it's all about the Vespa. The Vespa is exactly. the fucking is, is my escape plan for right. sure. And the fact that you, everyone I've told this, told uh, my reasoning for it goes, and I go, oh, yeah, I know it's kind of crazy. They all go, man, eh, it's not that crazy. No, so that's what. And it is. West Side Collector Car Storage, if there's an earthquake, is probably one of the safest places in Los Angeles. Right. I don't know, elevate like if there was an, a, a tsunami, I'm not sure what would happen here. I don't well, know. It's going to go up the river, which is not too far away. Yeah, I don't know if a tsunami would affect us here. We're a, we're over a mile inland. Yeah, but it's a mm. pretty flat fucking mile. It's, it's a sure pretty is. flat mile. Um, and even if you count the if you count the ocean as ending in Playa, then we're over a mile. We're like two and a half miles from the ocean. If you count the ocean as ending at the wetlands at Lincoln, it becomes more like a mile. If the tsunami reaches this building and you are anywhere but in, if you are at home, yeah. you're dead. Oh, so, if I'm at home, yeah. Right. I'm so fucking, I think yeah. it doesn't really matter what happens. I don't know if here. I'm dead. I think the third floor of my house would if be it, spared. I feel like if it has the force to reach here, no, it would go through. It would just go through. Yeah. It would go in my house. Would you quickly open the garage door? <laughs> it would go in my house, yeah, and it would blow out the back. It would go. It would blow out the other side. Like, here think, you go. Yeah. I think the third floor would probably, like, you'd lose the first floor. The ground it's floor gone. is fucking gone. <laughs> yeah. Right? The ground floor is gone. But the third floor, I think you'd probably survive. Yeah. Wow. Hopefully we never have to answer these questions. Hopefully I move <laughs> out of my Venice house before the, the next, tsunami comes. Yeah, 10 months or yeah. so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a couple. There's a. There's like a little... A little bit of elevation, just enough. It's probably like yeah, yeah. at the new house, like just just a little bit of elevation there. You're far. You're much farther away. Yeah, which yeah, is very good. Yeah, yeah. So but so you're gonna ride it because for you know because exercise. As people know, because like, motorcycle, I crashed a motorcycle, and exercise. you know, five, and I don't really want to ride one on the street ever again. But uh, I will if I have to. So you can ride it around, and it's a nice little thumper, man. It's gonna cruise. I'm excited. I'm gonna take it for a cruise once in a while. But it's uh, you towed it. 400 miles yeah. with a Kia Telluride. I did. I towed it down. I just rented. U-Haul has And by the way, get trailers. in the Super Chat if you want to talk we about so something. Oh, we do? We do. Okay, don't get in the Super Chat. We we have three pages of questions. <laughs> oh, we do? Yeah, Fuck yeah, me. Yeah. Okay. So all thank right. you all for your questions. All right, bail on the questions uh, and then Kia Telluride. Um, oh, I got to go back to... There we go. Uh, yeah. U-Haul um, has awesome little motorcycle trailers you can rent for $12. Which is was it the whole trip the was price. twelve dollars? Yeah, I ran it for twenty bucks, wow. which is great. And but yeah, I towed it down. It didn't really notice the trailer being there. I mean, it's not a very strong engine, right? It's a two hundred ninety horsepower. Yeah, it's three point eight V six exactly. But with a motorcycle that weighs four hundred pounds and a trailer that weighs twelve pounds, it doesn't really notice mm -hmm. it that much, and it was fine. What what we didn't talk about in what our was review the top today? Speed with your trailer. Um. U-Haul says you should only go 55 miles an hour, Matt. Oh, yes. I mean, so, of course we need to listen to On the around. record, that's exactly what I did. Um, on a closed course, I think I went like 75 <laughs> because the speed limit on, on the 5 is 70. No sway? No, zero sway because the motorcycle trailer is narrow. So I think the the car breaks all the wind and it doesn't you know cause the sway. And I think if I went up to 80 or above, it might have started doing a little bit of dancing, but I didn't test it. Yeah, so yeah. there's no wind buffeting. And I drove <clears> – <throat> that car has really, really impressive – lane keep assist and steering assist to to a level that it reminded me of driving a model three out to palm springs three years ago 
like it this will irritate you and anyone else who wants to drive cars for forever it's like i was driving in 40 mile an hour wind crosswinds on the way up there and i had my hands near the wheel i was like let's just see how this goes and it didn't budge say dead really? center lane the whole way and it, if it had if the highway had corners like the That's democratization good for towing in the wind it, it's helpful for towing in the wind um <clears throat> But also, it kind of shocked me how good that tech is on cars that are less and less expensive. You know, it used to be the yeah. Model S, which was 100 Gs, then the Model 3, which is 50 to 70 grand. And now, yeah, this car was $50,000, but I'm sure this tech is going to end up on a sedan that's 35. Yeah, well, didn't, it really just, didn't we out. just have it in like the fucking Corolla or the Mazda 3 or something? The Corolla had it, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you're, the Ducati has it, which is insane. <laughs> the Ducati has I mean, radar you know, cruise, but the radar yeah. cruise, but the, when this Land Keep Assist was better than the Volvos that we drove last year. I have yet to drive a car that has good Land Keep Assist. I've never driven a car that has a good one. And I'm, I'm not talking about when it intrudes when you get near the lane. I'm saying you can set these things and keep your hands near the wheel. Or in Kia's case, you can just breathe on the wheel and it thinks your hand is there. And it just follows the freaking highway. It's weird. <clears throat> it's weird. I was surprised at how good it was in a car that's this cheap from this brand. That's good. Well, but it's going to increase uh, the number of people that are yep you know, not driving, not driving, yeah, which is not good. Speaking of which, did you see that story of Tesla's DMV filing? Yeah, it's very funny, right? Yeah, it's very funny. It's it's the most um, it's gaslighting. It's it's just well, do you call is it gaslighting or is it swindling? What's the what is the word where you tell your customers and your investors that something is possible right around the corner? and that they can buy in right now to have it, and then you tell regulators now that the thing you have implied for years is available right around the corner to customers is actually not a feature of what you're selling at all and will not be a feature. Was that, was that, it's got to be that, something. I think, I think it's think gaslighting, gaslighting in politics. Uh, it's swindling. Gaslighting sure. is when I say, uh, you know, you catch me throwing a brick through you, and I'm like, no, nah, I didn't do that. You saw me do it. I'm like, hmm, that's not what you saw. I think right. So this would be just swindling. Yeah, or just false advertising. Um, I don't know. Yeah, but I mean, it's 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 definitely not full self driving. Um, it definitely will not be full self driving with this uh, particular suite of technology. So if you so the story have bought is the like full self driving kit. Right. You don't actually get anything. Yeah, Elon Musk. <laughs> this is uh, from Jalop a couple of days ago. Elon Musk tweeted an announcement that the demand for Tesla's new full self-driving beta software, level two autonomous, semi-autonomous system, uh, was so high Tesla would make it available to any Tesla owner. But then, in their actual DMV paperwork, they say that the uh, final release of city streets will continue to be level two, only advanced driver So they're saying, like you said, to customers, like, it's going to drive itself. And then they tell the DMV, like, it's not going to drive right. itself. Right. Now, if you want an excuse to be a Tesla stan here... I'll give you one. The excuse is that later in that statement, the, the thing that's redlined there in mm -hmm. Jalopnik, later in the statement it says that they will continue to develop and research autonomous technology and that they intend to study, make safe, validate, appeal to all regulators, and eventually have this technology. They, so if you want to say, well, you go, oh, 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 oh well, this, this is just about city streets. Okay, but the, quote, full self-driving suite to be, quote, feature complete, city streets is the last thing. Mm -hmm. So what they are saying is full self-driving is not, and this shows that it's not. They may develop, and they use the word, even Tesla may use, we may continue to develop, oh, see right there, please note that Tesla's development of true autonomous features... SAE level three plus will follow our et cetera process iterative processes and development, right? So if you want to be a stan, you go, oh well, this is just about city streets. But if you want to read what I I think is the the more subtle message here is that Tesla's own statement makes a very clear distinction between full self-driving, city streets, and true autonomous features. And it says definitively by making a separate paragraph and saying that their development of true autonomous features will continue and does his whole separate statement about that, it's basically admitting 
that what they are selling now and can sell now is not and will not be true autonomous features. Right. I feel like they're doing something kind of like when you see natural flavors on a soda because someone changed a law that says you can call that you can you can call you know iron filings natural flavors. Right. So they're like exactly. you know we've copy oh, great. we've copywritten Habibi. right behind the microphone. We've copywritten the term self-driving technology whatever it's you know it's all capital letters but the actual technology itself will not exist. All right, I'll switch to you and I'll get paper towels. Bro, you go get the paper towels. You spilled the whiskey on the table. Mother f- this, this dude is spilling the whiskey on the table. <sighs> the point being, if you paid for that system, you have gotten nothing. Um, and, and what is important about that is not that you've paid for something and gotten nothing, but it's who is liable Who's at fault when you or that system gets into a crash? And as it is right now, if you crash with a Tesla and that Tesla is running the autopilot system at the time you crash, it's your fault because you didn't take over, right? You weren't vigilant enough to take over and avoid that crash. And it is your responsibility to be vigilant. So it's therefore your fault. If you attempt to take over and try to make an evasive maneuver and get into a crash anyway, it is also your fault because you were driving at the time of the accident. So just so you, everyone is, understands how that system works, and that is how the system works with a level two system. It's your fault if the car crashes while the hands-free system is being used because you weren't driving and you agreed in that disclaimer that you would be vigilant and responsible. And if you try to take over and crash anyway, that's also your fault because you were driving and not the car. So in my opinion, I've said it over and over and over, autonomous vehicles means liability go, is on the manufacturer of that vehicle. The, that, the person who programmed it, the team who programmed it, the set of rules and parameters that they have decided this car has to follow, um, you know, it's on them. And so as long as Tesla is willing to put the onus of responsibility on the driver for literally anything that happens to the car, <laughs> that's, it's, it's just, uh, well, it's, so we, it's smarmy, shitty, mark. It's, it's, imp, it's marketing by implication to people that want the future here so bad and are being financially rewarded for you know if you if you're an investor you know what i mean if you get you buy stock well the more good buzzwords the better right you are financially rewarded ha- very handsomely for not breaking with the lie you know what i mean well very- I, I guess are you are you saying are you expecting investors to come out and you know tweet or whatever and be like, "I bought Tesla stock, but this is horseshit" or "This is well, I'm just I, I'm or... just saying that if that that they're they're financially incentivized to go to bat no matter what. Yeah, true. I mean, that's just why, like you know, just like you know, stock. Republican politicians are incentivized to be be Trumpy because it's <laughs> so far. <laughs> Seems to work out for them, and the ones who break with with Trump don't. Well, I would say so, during his administration, it became yeah. very clear that if you didn't support him, yeah, and I, I don't want to try to divide the audience, but like he would he would tweet for you or against you, yeah, that, like that was a thing that happened. Right. So, um, and so, the same way, Democrats, Republicans, anyone, they vote for their lobbyists a lot of the time. So you're incentivized, incentivized to get in line, right? So, right. so in that, if you're an investor. And you've invested in this company, and the comp- what the company is selling isn't real, but you're invested. You're not going to blow the whistle. You're not going to be like, you know what, this is bullshit. You're going to be like, see how much money, look how much money I'm making. Yeah, that's true. I, th- I think gonna- a lot of people are. It'll it'll also self reinforce not- the fact that the st- the fact that the valuation is so high reinforces, you know, oh, but if it was doing something wrong. NHSCA would have stopped him, right? 
Right. Well, of course they would have, right? Because that's that they. It's so big. If they were doing something wrong, NHSTA must would, would stop National Highway Transit Safety Association would stop them, right? Well, a story just came out in the L.A. Times that the last four years NHSTA was, and this is a quote from the other Times, completely asleep at the wheel, just unaware of what's happening. Un, L.A. Times. Uh, f- uh there you. Uh, yeah. Uh, da, 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 da. Agency hid. Let's see. Uh, there's a lot. There's, there's a, a lot, lot of links. There's a uh, lot. For those who are mean, listening, there's a lot of links. There's a lot. It was. I this story was from a couple. It's okay. A couple matter. days ago, or a couple. Excuse me. About a, a couple months ago, um, but it was. It was basically that that Tesla is working very hard to avoid regulation. And I understand where you go, well, they're a company. Of course they work to regu- avoid regulation. And But, the, but the, the thing that they're working to avoid regulation of involves the safety of people who haven't signed up for the beta test. Right. That's the interesting thing with all of this is that – and, I mean, there's probably plenty of companies that have made us uh, the guinea pigs too, but – the people that buy what you said it great. The people that buy the cars are not the only guinea pigs. The people that are around them are also the. I'm guinea on pigs, a motorcycle. You know? so, right, right. I'm lane splitting here. Right. You know what I mean? So like, that's the difference. If, if you if you drink a, so, a soft drink that people go that there's poison in that, you're like, well, if I don't drink the soft drink, the person sitting next to me that does, they're the guinea pig, but I'm not the guinea pig. But mm-hmm. the difference here is if we're all in traffic, we're all in traffic. Yeah. It's like wearing a mask. You're not. It's not just you, bro. Right. It's not just you. You know what I mean? I have a strong immune system. It's like, it's, not it's I think it's incredibly selfish of people um, to think, and I'm talking about self-driving cars, not masks right now, to think that whatever accidents might happen, if a, if a quote, self-driving car or a Tesla running a system right now gets into an accident, it's it's sort of it's sort of seen as a cost of doing business. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. It's, but it's, in my it's, opi- it's the the eggs in the omelet. In my opinion, you can't do bad to do good. Doing go- you cannot do bad to do good. Well, I mean, I don't know which company it was. I'm sure there's plenty of them. Like this is a literal thing, but companies have figured out, you know. Uh, what's the cost if people get hurt versus fixing the thing? Right. You know? Well, you go back to you know Ford and the fucking Pinto and all now the whole thing. I'm not and no and no, I'm not a, I'm not saying that other companies haven't done shitty things in the past for sure, but other companies don't have valuations that are far beyond a their market profit. share and profit and and their in, their income statements and b their technology. You know, they don't, you know, so other companies that do shitty things are valued on a different scale than this company that does shitty things. Yeah, it, uh, it's, and a I weird, feel unsafe it's a on weird, the perfect storm of, of CEO worship, mm-hmm. you know, this, this icon stuff we have for people that, you know, invent things or do amazing things, um, plus the products, plus as the value goes up, it gets more attention and it's just, it feeds itself. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And conflation of things that are unrelated. If you happen to be an, the CEO of two companies and one makes cars and one builds rockets, the fact that one does their job well does not mean a fucking thing about the other one being able to do their job but well. But to humans, it does. Like Humans we associate, are stupid as are. a motherfucker. Have you ever seen late night TV where someone <laughs> famous is selling something that they yeah. have never made? Yeah. Of course. No, like, the idea that you could build... No, look, I'm not. I'm not saying I'm not impressed by SpaceX. I'm impressed by SpaceX. They're, yeah, they're impressed by SpaceX. Yeah. I am. I don't think Elon builds the rockets. I think he told someone to figure out how to make a rocket land, and then those smart people did, and they don't get credit, and we don't know their names. Mm. That's how I think of course that it takes more than one person. Nevertheless, yeah. building a rocket that lands or five rockets that land is not the same thing as building 500,000 cars that all need to be exactly the same. No, but I think to people, if they go, the, the, the person who is purported to have led SpaceX to where they are is this, you know, if they can apply their methodology and intellect to developing a, to creating a team that, you know, reach these goals, 
than if they apply themselves to this. It's like if someone. But is those teams a, don't do the same thing. It's like Carl Ruiz used to talk about a, food chef versus restaurant chef. Food chef goes, "I'm going to make you the best dish that you've ever seen, and that will taste good for three judges one time." Okay. Restaurant chef. I'm gonna go wants the customer to come back every month for two years and his favorite dish is exactly the same every single time. That's a restaurant chef. Right. And he said this this food celebrity culture has convinced people with money that TV chefs could always be good restaurant chefs. Mm, and they very often cannot because people who came up after the food network started on a TV chef path instead of being a good restaurant chef and then jumping over to TV. And so being a TV chef is like SpaceX. They can build a small number of things that are very, very impressive, but that the public really never has to interact with firsthand. Mm -hmm. Restaurant chef never meets the public, but needs to serve the same exact fucking steak and hamburger 100,000 times a month. Right. And so that's what the OEMs are. The OEMs are restaurant chefs, and and SpaceX and Tesla are TV chefs. I think the OEMs have a hard job because they're trying, you know, every couple of years they have to try to also be TV chefs for a little bit. Mm-hmm. They have to impress us with whatever the new right. car is. The new, you know, you have an M4 sitting outside. It's like BMW had to they had to remake the hamburger, right? Because you're like, well, I really like the last hamburger. They're like, well, the new recipe. It's well, better, in, we promise. Well, in the modern world, a great restaurant chef should have some media training. <laughs> not saying they shouldn't, but they shouldn't not be a restaurant chef anymore. You know what I mean? So that's R.I.P. Carl. That's a Carl. Oh, that's right. a Carl Ruiz. I'm wearing the bracelet. That's a fucking Carl Ruiz. Uh, some knowledge dropped in, but uh, but yeah, I, we don't need to dwell on this. But that's that's basically. I wanted to bring it up because it's when someone tells their fans one thing and tells regulators something different. Right. That's not just a business trying to avoid regulation. That's that's you're selling something that's half baked and not in line with what you're filing legally about this product. And meanwhile, yeah, there's some fucking hardcore people who want to sign up and use this new technology. I'm sure they fucking do. But here's me on my green Vespa, and I didn't sign up for it. And how do I know which ones in the 405 are using this shit? Yeah, that's true. I don't. They got. They should wear. They should have to wear a big fucking. You should. <laughs> they should have to mail out a big orange cone, <laughs> a big traffic cone. They should. Some fucking student driver shit. They got to put on the car. That's a great point. Yeah. They should have like a light. Let me LED know. I want to know how yeah. to keep a wide ass berth from this shit box software. Because right. what if Vespa wasn't programmed in that? Because every that, time yeah. I've tried to use autopilot in a Tesla, it's trash. Really? Yes. I've every only single used it once, time. But I was very impressed. I've never made it more than 45 seconds without it doing something very sketchy. I did, and I've yeah. gone, nope. Thank you. I don't know. It'd be what it'd be. Yeah. But I didn't sign up for it. Period. Right. So that's the difference between them and, uh, you know, companies like Waymo or whatever Apple's development company. Like, they, <clears throat> Ford had, I, I got to go when Ford had their test circuit of fusions. And it was like they have a four block square area that's yeah. on their proving grounds. And that's where they're doing their stuff. And I know they test out and like they branch out, but they do a lot of their testing in a controlled environment with yeah. engineers riding. And I'm not anti like, public you know, road testing, but Waymo, the difference between the, regula- the regulation. And what has to go on with a Waymo test vehicle and a Tesla are completely different things. Waymo vehicles have like logbooks and shit, like like a plane would have. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like it's a it's a whole different, separate set of paperwork and regular. Like a ma- if if Tesla were to allow a level three system in California, every vehicle equipped with a level three system would have to have a logbook that gets filled out in basically real time with every trip used. I bet they have that in the computer somewhere. I bet no, we it has don't to see be, it. It's not automated. This is logbook. People but, just write it the in. The operator has to do this shit. Yeah, because they they're test vehicles. The test vehicles have to be monitored. That's what they do. You're the monitor. It's like a pilot. You file the logbook of the, of the flight and the plane. Hmm. So test vehicles, 
they're owned by corporations that are testing. So it's someone's job to drive around or to ride around in this vehicle, monitor for something bad, and fill the logbook out. But imagine trying to ask people who just spent $100,000 on a Tesla, oh, by the way, you have to fill out a logbook every time you use this feature? No, but I think, and Tesla don't sue me for speculation, but I think that they're collecting data every time the cars go out, and they're just making the owners, the test engineers, passively. So so if, 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 the, if Autopilot's engaged, like, the, actually, sorry, we know this because of when there's almost been accidents, you know, Tesla goes... To the, to, to the computer and they go, here's what happened. Like that guy fell asleep mm. with his foot on the gas, right? I'm not talking about data logging. Right, but I'm isn't... talking about an actual logbook. But why But why is a logbook where someone writes, like, I drove here today and this w- w- versus data that says, here's my route, because, here's be- the errors because I the had, point here's is, driver intervention? Because the point is that a human has to monitor the system and we need evidence, old school ass paper evidence, that a human was there monitoring the system because these level so three vehicles are test vehicles yeah yeah they're not just you can't sell them to somebody it's not just a level three car in america in the state of california this is right. the state of california where tesla's main fucking factory is okay so you can't just sell these cars to people there's no such thing as a privately owned waymo vehicle doesn't right, exist yeah, right not, yeah so so the people who are riding around in these waymos are filling out logbooks when they're in California. Now, Arizona, where I think a lot of Waymo stuff happens, I don't think they require that. It's a state-by-state thing. Oh, interesting. So that's that's another thing, is that the regulations state-by-state are not the same. The same. So it's really about California. You know, like emissions, it's, it's California drives, you know, what you can sell to the public. For instance, Honda... Acura just announced the the legend fall car in Japan that has a level three system in it. Japan does not have a rule against operating a level three system on the street from the public. So they're Honda's fucking doing it. Fucking YOLO, send it. I don't know. But how, I think I don't I know how that's, that's gonna go. I but think that's what Tesla different did. regulations. Tesla YOLO sent it. Tesla went we have this basic tech, they probably tested it a lot before they released it. They went, you know, this is pretty good. And they put it out there, and then it just keeps – they keep making new iterations and keep trying to refine But they're trying to test – do the testing and development, you know, live. That's – yeah, that's like right. what I'm like not really about. No, no, I understand. <laughs> and, I'm saying, and it sounds like – it sounds like there's different – like Waymo, Ford, other companies are like, we are going to play this real slow and real careful because yeah. they don't want to get – they don't – Ford doesn't want to be that name. Waymo doesn't want to be that name. And every now and then, Tesla, someone has an accident, and Tesla has to go in there and say, like, wasn't our fault. Here's why. Well, that's the thing. You, you, you got to you gotta throw your customer under the bus. <laughs> you got to say. It's like, um, it's like modern medicine. You socialize the development costs and privatize the profits. You know what I mean? What are the development costs? The development costs are my company. life on a scooter. That car, that car crashes into me. You are socializing the development costs. You mean in terms of, but medicine? You mean because they do, uh, you know, testing folk, government? Testing yeah, the like government that. funds the testing. The, I haven't, I, I haven't volunteered for, for necessarily for my taxes to go to this, but well, I think if you have like a new drug, the company has to pay the FDA to try and certify it, but they also have to pay for the testing. Right. So that's private, private costs, and then it gets approved, and then it goes out in the public. But a lot of times the the public, you know, pays right. for, some, pays for this effects. stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Which is a whole different thing. Right. And so anyway. Yeah. Uh we should go to the people. Oh my God. This is gonna be a long show. Better keep the bourbon Powered going. Powered by whiskey. Powered by fucking Powered bourbon. Powered by Taconic. Mm-hmm. All right. I hope we get through these. If you didn't make it onto this round, we'll, we'll get make you. it we'll do speed round. Get you on the next one. Mitchell Clifton, desk diver watch for under six thousand bucks. Good loom, a date, bracelet, ideally 42 millimeters or less. Top runners are the Omega Seamaster 300M, Tudor Pelagos, the Grand Seiko 229, and the Sin 104. What else should I check out? Interesting choices. I would start looking. I The Tudor Pelagos is great. I would also look at the Black Bay. Check out the Bremonts. Shout out to my sponsors. Love them. Um... The Omega Seamaster you've got there is great. I mean, Desk Diver, Speedmasters are great as well. Um, Wildcard, Cartier Santos, 
interesting. Square watches, if you might want to fuck with a square watch, you never really know. That might that's a wild card there. Also, uh, an Omega Planet Ocean uh, is a great one. They come in different sizes, forty two millimeters or less. Um, yeah, yeah. Planet Ocean. There you go. That's a good looking Planet watch. Planet Ocean's a good looking watch. I don't like watch. many watches. That's I like the Planet watch. Ocean. I think that's one of the nicer watches that Omega makes. They come in different sizes. There's a there's there's some that are bigger, but you don't want the chrono. The chrono gets real thick. Um Kevin Bolash says, To my knowledge, if you list a car I haven't previewed these, by the way, so some of these might be a fucking We're just going for it. Uh, if you list a car on BAT or Cars and Bids with good picks, videos, and records, you still have to entertain in-person videos and test drivers who will likely never bid. I mean, I will say this. As a seller, the more engaged you are, the better your listing will do. Do you have to entertain in-person visitors and test drivers? No, but I wouldn't necessarily say, like, you're not a dealership. It's not like it's like tire kickers. If someone sees a car and bring a trailer and makes an effort to come see you as a private seller, I, I don't know if they're just coming to take a test drive. That doesn't really seem in line with my experience. Um, I agree. It could happen, certainly. In my, in my experience, when I was selling my DeLorean on Bring a Trailer, someone came to my house to see the car. And I didn't let them drive it, but I took them for a ride around the block, uh, and they, they looked over it. They didn't end up bidding, but they went into the comments, and they said, I went to see this car at Matt's house, and it's fabulous. And so, you know, the guy didn't bid, and it took a little few minutes of my time, but 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 he, he pumped the auction, you know, in the comments. So I think just a general rule the more engaged you're willing to be as a seller the better it's gonna do yeah. yeah i think you know make sure that the just just be smart about who you let drive it if you let anybody drive it if you're selling anything that is being sought after by 22 year olds you might want to not let all the visitors <laughs> drive it but it nothing in person will never replace be replaced by videos and pictures and the videos and pictures that people put on ads are really really good yeah and people can find some problems through the internet they go i see rust there i see this thing i see a, a, a panel sticker is missing that was changed that's awesome but it just it will never replace the number of things you can see if you're there in person yeah uh kip abel says how did i know the car storage business would be successful what was my market research process um i called everywhere in town they're all they were all full <laughs> everywhere in town was full that did this business so um that to me said that this is a big enough, you know, LA is millions and millions of people, um, and and these businesses hold, you know, hundred, two hundred cars. You know, there, there, there's there's really always room, um, um, and and I selfishly wanted the business for myself. You know, I didn't, I, I just, I just felt. You know, I had a real "if you build it, they will come" mentality. We have a very premium piece of property. I built a beautiful building. Anyone who comes in here goes, "Holy shit, you're out of your mind!" And um, I, I well, there's a lot of people that had your situation as well, where you know, you you don't have a palatial house in Beverly Hills with eight cars that can mm -hmm. fit on the driveway. Like, not many people have that in the city. But there's yeah. a lot of car enthusiasts. A lot of people have more than one car, more than one fun car. Yeah. And have a similar living situation, housing situation. Yeah. If you live space. near the beach, you don't have a lot of places to keep shit. You you might have a two-car garage. You might be that lucky. Mm -hmm. You might have a driveway. But you might not. <laughs> so I just um, – I, and, I, and I made a map. I made a map of everywhere in my city – and all the storage places and how much they cost and where they were. And there was a big hole right where I lived. <laughs> I, think you, I think you nailed it. Uh, Ryuka Chu says, would I ever consider doing a classic EV conversion? What specs or price point would make you do it? Do you mean, I, if, does he mean for the personal collection, I think? I think so. Yeah, yeah. You, Zach? What would make oh, you totally. do it? Oh, totally. I mean, I think... I thought about how cool it would be to convert my dad's P1800 EV, mm -hmm. but I think he would miss the sound a bit because he used to drive that car. I think most old luxury cars from the 50, 40s, 50s, 60s yeah. could easily be EV, especially some of those cars that had 
inline eights that were really quiet. So many of the cars back then were all about, even now, like luxury cars were trying to be quiet. Packard, Cadillac, right. whatever. Yeah, the engines are fun, but they're not they're not meant to be loud in those cars. So if you if you took a Lincoln Continental, 60s Lincoln and made that EV, that'd be awesome. That'd be great, right? It'd be quiet. Someone's doing the old Rolls yeah, Royces, which I thought was was great. Genius. Yeah. I just drove for my new show on Haggerty a Willie's Jeep that was converted to EV. And it um I thought that was a great one too. Uh this would be like the perfect Nantucket vehicle. You know what I mean? What are you looking at, Zach? It's one of the cameras is doing something weird. Oh, okay. Um you know, would I personally do it? No, I don't think so because um, there's nothing that I want to drive that's that's that old, but that I also hate the powertrain of. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I drove that EV DeLorean. I mean, that was fabulous, right? It was a little rough, that exact one, but... Um, there we go. You right there? Yep, yep. It was a little rough it went early, you know, but the idea of an electric DeLorean right. is fabulous. That was so cool. The black one, right? No, the black one was the other tuned one, but oh, this sorry. one was silver. But, but yeah, but it was the same day I drove it. But, yeah, electric DeLorean would be cool. But, like, to do an EV conversion proper, it's like 50. It's a lot of money. It's like 50 it's Gs. A lot of money. And so you're really talking about getting into a project. Yeah, I mean, I, right now I'm thinking of unlimited budget stuff. This yeah. is fantasy land. Like, yeah. would I do it if I could? For sure. I think there's plenty of yeah. cars that limps. Volkswagen buses, all of them. The Volkswagen them. bus EV was very cool. Yeah. That's very cool. Yeah, especially because you've got a fucking big flat floor, right. you know, to work with. Yeah. yeah. Louis Correa says, I have a mid-2000s Omega Speedmaster Pro. I'm tempted to pair, trade for a Panerai Luminor 320. Now, if you want a Panerai, watch Carl always said and I think he was right that whether you're eating at a restaurant you're buying a watch or you're buying a car you want to buy what that company does well mm -hmm. you don't go to McDonald's and get the salad right you know what I mean you, you, you go to a place called Dave's Burgers you get a burger you know what I mean it's just like because that's what they know how to do so with a Panerai what you want is a simple dial sandwich, the, what they call the sandwich dial. It's a very distinct, they have layers of dial material that they sandwich and they cut the numerals out so you can actually oh, see the, the, depth. the layer of depth. So okay. sandwich dial, big loom, a Speedmaster uh, to a Panerai 320, it's going to be bigger. So you, gotta, you don't want to have too small of a wrist to go for it, and you want to have the right strap to match, but... That's a good that's a good option. Those Panerai Luminors, you want the sandwich dial, very classy, very legible. It's a good it's a good 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 move. I like that move. Yeah. Uh also have I ever been confused for a cholo? Nah. My face is pretty white. I don't really do I don't, I don't If I go to Europe, I can kind of blend in the sort of generic mm -hmm. olive. They start talking to me in Italian or whatever, but nah. Someone spoke to me in Italian at a uh airport in Italy and I said I'm sorry I don't speak Italian and they went oh neither do I I'm I'm visiting they were like from Britain but they just started it was really funny it's great it was, it was a good moment like when I tried to speak Spanish that cab driver in Mexico and after 20 <laughs> minutes the dude's like look I'm from Chicago <laughs> <laughs> uh scouting for Zen says that I mentioned shock absorption for watches is it a bad idea to wear my Seiko dive watch when I ride my motorcycle no it's not um there are certain watches that are shock resistant. The Bremont MB2 I was talking about, uh, the Rolex Melgos is a shock resistant watch. It, if you're really do like the only thing that you really need shock absorption for is if you're like hammering, <laughs> literally, if you're like hammering or like using like a lot of power tools like jackhammers and shit like that, or shooting guns a lot, mm -hmm. like real shock. Motorcycles. I have not found to be that to be that much of an issue. Vibration is different from shock. Um, I would not worry about riding your motorcycle while wearing a Seiko dive watch. Uh, Sean McGraw says, "What are your thoughts on the 1992, 1993 IROC oh Dodge Daytona RTs?" Um, they got better looking as they got newer. So the '92 was the best looking of them. I like them in monochrome. I like them in white on white on white. 
There's a guy who rolls around L.A. Do you remember like the dude from wheels. Radwood who's got the engine swapped one of these? Yeah, the engine swap one is amazing. There's a dude who's got a 6-1 he- Hemi swapped into one of these rear drive. Because this is a front-wheel drive car. It's a turbo four-cylinder front-wheel drive car. I feel like I can really understand where the 90s Monte Carlo front end came from right now. Looking at this profile, mm-hmm. those lights. It's there were a lot stuff. of a RX-7 sporty in there. coupes. Yeah. That you could buy nice. back in the day. Totally. That weren't like M3 level performance. You know what I mean? Just yeah. gener- generally sporty coupes. A lot of them were front wheel drive, but still had, still had decent engines. You know, the, the, the fucking Berettas and the Daytonas and then the Nissan 200SXs and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Who was who made the video? Camisa. Camisa made the video. Huge list of them. Yeah, huge yeah, list. Really yeah. Good. Yeah, there used to be a ton of them, and now they're very, very few. Are you, dude, back in the day, I used to fuck with these. I used to, I used to like these back in the day. Straight up, when I was a kid, I, you know, I worked at Foot Locker starting when I was fourteen. When I turned seventeen, the rule was all the money I'd saved. I didn't spend a dime. All my Foot Locker money, I worked two, three days a week from when I was fourteen until I was seventeen at Foot Locker, and I kept working afterwards. But all of that money went into an account, and then whatever I spent on the car, my dad was going to match it. That was my car money. I wanted a car so badly. And I didn't really want, I wanted a new car. I didn't even want a used car. I I wanted a new car. And so I had $14,000 that I had saved up. My dad was going to match it. And so I was looking, not at Dodge Daytonas, but I was looking at the Chrysler Sebring two doors. Remember those? Yes, I do. Kind of good looking, right? The first gen Sebring, because like, and I was looking at, uh, the Sebring two doors, yeah, the early Sebring coupe. Those are the later ones. That was the early one. They're on the on the <laughs> right here. Down, down that one. That the red one. Yeah, there you go. The ninety nine. Yeah, yeah, that thing. It actually was kind of good looking. I mean, not the one with the bra on it. <laughs> <laughs> I will disagree with you here, but uh, you know what? We like what we like. That's okay. You know, whatever. Okay. I thought it was cool at the time. I thought a Geo Storm was cool when I was a kid, so I can't. Geo Storms really were kind of cool. I mean, I was like that's seven, an Isuzu, but yeah, handling by Lotus. I never realized how small because yeah. I saw them when I was a kid, kid, and now I see them. And I'm like, that could fit in my pocket. <laughs> Isuzu impulses were cool. Jajaro design also handling by Lotus. Um, Luke S says. I, he remembers I don't like how the Huayra drove. Would I prefer to drive a new one? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you hook it up. Do you want to drive a new version of one of the most Do you have it? best looking, Luke, fastest cars ever made? I of accept course. your offer to drive your Pagani. Please <laughs> please email me. Smokingtire at gmail.com. Yeah. That'd be great. Have you ever thought about driving a Pagani uh, Huayra BC Roadster? Yeah. Yeah, me too. Uh, Polar Bear says, I'm about to pull the trigger on a bunch of Bosphorus straps. There is not an affiliate discount code. Thank you, Polar Bear. Bosphorus is my my homies in Turkey. Never met them in person, but lovely people. They hand make these really great straps. They look good on big face. Good. Uh, pilot's watches, tool watches, Panerai's, Bremont's, um, Big face IWC pilots watches. They look awesome. Super and, comfortable too. Yeah, and they make really beautiful nice. cases. They make beautiful watch rolls. And um, I don't have a discount code. And and uh, they're just good people. Just buy it because it's really high quality. It's a good high quality item. Sean Finney says I'm putting relatively expensive Olin's suspension on an MD Miata. ND Miata. Is it worth it? F- with a DD for four to five track days a year, am I tuning out of class? That seems kind of cheap for Olin stuff, really. Two and a half grand. I mean, what's that, what was the set of the KW threes for the um, Focus RS Focus, or the Fiesta? Either one. I didn't really. have v, we didn't have V threes in the Fiesta. Oh. We didn't do that. We done the Focus RS. The adaptive shocks were right. Like, Fifty five hundred dollars. Yeah, I mean, I think really good coilovers are. That four seems to eight cheap for Olin. That does. It, that's. <sighs> If, no, here's, I mean, the, look, here's what I would say. If you're daily driving it and the suspension you're putting on improves the daily driving experience, you know, then it's worth it. If it ruins the daily driving experience and they're rock hard for whatever reason, you set them wrong, they're the wrong spec, et cetera, et cetera, then it's not worth it. Uh, I agree what he said. JL says, will putting an overkill supercharger 
on my 2010 Cadillac CTS V6 all-wheel drive ruin it? Yeah, probably. I mean, it won't necessarily ruin it, but it's definitely not worth it. It's, I mean, yeah, well, it, it's, it's not, not worth it's, it. It's not worth it. I Do mean, that you're not going to get the money back. Do that math. How long are you on the car for? If you're going to own the car a long time and you like everything about it and you just want it to be brought to modern speed standards, you're then, already talking sure. about an 11 year old average Cadillac. And there's, look, there's nothing wrong with a 2010 Cadillac CTS. I remember getting one as a press car. It's fine. But they made a V. And if you really want a fast one of those, the V is available. And if you don't care about a manual, the V is cheap. Yeah, yeah. Figure out whatever the price of the supercharger is. See if that money plus selling your car will get you into a V. Yeah, I just... Uh, Will it ruin yeah. the car? Not necessarily. No. Will, it, will it be not a money that's not worth spending? Absolutely. Uh, Nick Rogers wants to know if we've heard about the current developments with the EPA under the new admin. Modifying any car with a VIN could become illegal. Do you know about this? I saw a thing on Instagram about it today. I haven't looked into it, to be honest. I, wa um, I plan to because if it goes forward under... All right, we'll look into yeah, this. We need to look, at, we need to look into Sign, it to make sure. Please consider signing the RPM Act that CMA has made. Okay, we'll look into this. All right, thanks, Nick. We will, we will look into this. All right. Uh, Spencer says, is an E46 330Ci ZHP more fun and nimble than a 228i or M235i? I mean, this is tough because fun and – I haven't driven these cars back to back. Mm-hmm. The 228i M Sport I drove was shockingly good. The M235i is pretty good if you're talking about the rear drive one. An E46 is like a an old it's like an old car. You're talking about like a seven or eight thousand dollar car versus like a twenty five or thirty thousand dollar car, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, with different construction. Yeah, the chassis, the new chassis is going to be way, way, way stiffer. Yeah, a lot of new cars have solid mounted subframes which the e46 didn't i mean you, you just have more pliability in older cars so nimble is the word is kind of accurate i don't know i mean i mean we drove the turner spec e46 mm -hmm. which was fabulous right but like that was also like a track built car with a cage in it and it did that did not it was not street car rigidity mm -hmm. you know what i mean Absolutely. <sighs> it's it's a, it's a different class of car. It's a much newer car. They're, I've never they're all fun. ZHP, I don't know. I mean, but ZHP's fun. You, it's it's your car, with less but less power. good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's yeah. your car, but less good. So it's like, yeah, for like seven, eight grand, it's great. I th I think the more modern thing would be. I think it'd be more fun and nimble. I don't know if it, I can't say better, but fun and nimble. The newer car is going to probably be tighter in most ways. It's going to have more power and more torque. Yeah. So that's what my answer would be. Yeah. Chris O says, do we have any helpful tips for buying a used car out of state? What to look for getting a PPI? I mean, Oof. oh boy. Um, yeah. Here's a tip. Find a local independent shop and... You know, use the Google, use ratings or whatever, independent shop, and and get them to do a PPI. I mean, it's worth – a PPI goes a very, very long way yeah. from an independent shop. Do the legwork to find out what that independent shop is that's near where the, the car is and to, to convince the person selling the car to bring the car down there, you know, and get it, get it done. Mm -hmm. That 300 bucks goes a long way. Yeah. Huge, yeah. huge. Um, and then also just prepare that when it shows up, it's still going to need something. Probably. <laughs> Probably. If, if you can find a friend or someone you trust to go look at the car, that's yeah. the best thing, and still get a PPI. If you right. don't have that option, get a PPI and just really make sure you trust the shop because that, you know that's your only advocate there. Yeah. And, and call the shop afterwards to talk to them after the person who's selling it has left. For sure. Uh, Kyle Van Huster. Zach, her, uh, heard Zach talking about the book Tune to Win. Uh, thanks for the recommendation. Mm -hmm. Just picked it up. Jeremy says, is the extra 10K for a Veloster N worth it versus a CPO Fiesta ST? Uh, I'm torn, stretching my budget for the Veloster, but I, I would say no. No. Don't stretch your budget for the Veloster. 
Get the get the Fiesta. The Veloster's great. If you can afford it, it's great. It's a nice car. It if you have had a Fiesta ST before and you want the next thing that's new, it's definitely a good next thing. But if it's between one and the two and you could easily afford the Fiesta and it's a stretch to get the Veloster, just get the Fiesta. Yep. And take that little extra savings. Don't spend it. In case something breaks. You yep. never know. Absolutely. Uh, DB says, best rear-wheel drive four-door sedan under 20K for transporting small children and spirited... I mean, there's so many. And spirited driving. Uh, small children? IS350. There you go. It'll Lexus work. You have a family. You don't want to be repairing stuff all the time. It'll still seem premium inside for a long time. Yeah, That'll probably do it. IS350? Yeah. I like that one. I'm going to back up Zach on that one. Uh, or a GS, if you can get a GS as yeah. well. I mean, GS is lovely. Is really good. Yeah. Uh, Dunwell says, thoughts on the last gen V60 R design like Hannah had for a daily on Long Island. Um, the dynamics of front wheel drive Volvos are unique. I don't love them. I've tried to love them, but I don't love them. My wife did love her Volvo. But she does not give a fuck about dynamics. She puts it in D. My she, dad loves his, but yeah, same thing. You know, she uses 20% throttle. You know what I mean? She cared. She liked the Volvo because of the way the radio controls worked. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was literally that kind of thing. She liked the color. She liked the seats. You know what I mean? I mean, if this guy's just commuting on Long Island, though. It's a nice car. Yeah. It was a nice car. A the, nice seats car. Are, the seats are great. It is luxurious. You know what I mean? I loved the red. Um, but I... I think Volvo dynamically falls behind pretty much all the other premium companies. I agree. What I would say to him, uh, my dad had his for like 150,000 miles and drove it everywhere and treats it like garbage. And I got in it and his car sounded newer than mine with that many miles on yeah, it. Yeah, good. And so I think it seemed like it held up really well in terms of interior rattles, all that other stuff. Yeah. So it would probably hold up to a commute in uh, Long Island where probably. the roads are garbage. We, when when we garbage. returned Hannah's car at the end of her three-year lease with, I don't know, 20,000 miles on it or 18,000, it, it looked brand new. Yeah. You know, it held. It did hold up nice. It was a nice car. It just, the finer points of the dynamics were not there for me. But totally. But I'm a snob. Yeah. Uh, Diz5, which auto manufacturer is the most consistently reliable? Toyota. Yep. Uh, and Lexus, but Toyota, really. Uh, the P1 GTR rented a 2020 Miata RF, fell in love, but I can't buy it because I weigh too fitty. What are giggle-inducing cars like the Miata that plus-size guys can fit in? For under 50 grand. I mean, that's Civic Type R, dude. Yeah. You find Roomy. yourself a Civic Type R. has got plenty of room. Minis have plenty of room for bigger mm -hmm. drivers. Um, the Focus and Fiesta, the seats might not be so great. Um but uh, Camaro, Camaro, pretty spacious. Definitely under. Not 50. if you're tall. Right, depends on your height. Depends on tell you if you're tall versus heavy. Uh, you know, Boxsters and Caymans. You can you can drive a Cayman. Um, you can get a great Cayman for under fifty k, and you'll fit in it at two fifty for sure. Uh, Porsches are great for tall, fat people. Um, Corvettes. Oh, I mean, I mean that's fifty k gets you a ton of Corvette. Uh, giggle inducing. I mean, I don't know about giggle inducing, but like that's a lovely I'd car. Say Corvette. Yeah, Corvettes are great. Yeah, they're really 50K really good. Fifty K goes a long way. Yeah, yeah. Tony uh, Kroger from Car Driver said they banned um, using Corvette as the answer for window shopping because it was just too prevalent. It was like, what's the answer for this? Probably a Corvette. Mm -hmm. Nick Retsinas. Uh, I know you've previously said you like XJ Cherokees. If you were to acquire one, what spec would you get, and would you leave it stock or modify it? I would get a two. Uh, it was like a 1999-2000 Sport Cherokee Sport in teal. That you know that teal color yes, they did? did, and the reason that I would get it there it is the Cherokee Sport. Yeah, four door in that teal color. And the reason I would uh, uh, get it is because my friend Brandon K, uh, in high school, there it is, right there. That's the color. It's, it's, Where it's, oh. sil it's really silver, more so than the teal. I think in the middle, two thousand one. That guy, yeah. Because when I tell you the number of blunts that were smoked <laughs> in a Cherokee of that Blunt exact spec, pure 
Oh, there. The, even the picture to the bottom right of that one, where it's the stock wheels. That right. That's it. Yeah. It's a good look. Just straight L rides on the daily, and this car. When he had it, my friend Brandon crashed three of these. He was okay. These were. They were fucking shit boxes. I mean, this thing fucking vibe. You started up oh, yeah. and the whole car just vibrated. I mean, the idea that these things are they're nostalgic now because they're boxy and utilitarian and whatnot. They're fairly bulletproof, but they were, as a it's, driving uh, experience. The best for, case yeah. scenario was it drove like a UPS truck. Just <laughs> terrible. That's best case scenario. Yeah, it swayed like a sailboat. Right, but I probably smoked like four or five pounds of weed in one. And so that is the spec I would want. And I would... I would roll around on the on on a on a backcountry discovery route trail with that ounce and just blaze it. They're good. Yeah, that's, that's the one I, we that's bought. What I would do, but they're great. Yeah. Uh, Ramon says maybe I can video fast fire road driving lake beds, etc. What does that mean? Oh, does that mean instead that of? Thing? Oh, that means instead of going up the trails, I think. Oh, for off road stuff. Uh, yeah, maybe. I mean, that, that, that's diminishing returns. They don't like when you go on dry lake beds because they can never get the car clean again. And it's honestly not a great test of the vehicle. Like, what we're going to tell you that it slides, and we're going to tell you that we're going fast in the dirt. It'd be fun for us, but yeah, it's but really not a good assessment of what it can do. Yeah, it doesn't really matter. Uh, Richard H., one car versus two for $100,000. Tycon Base versus a GTI and a Cayman. Uh, I'd go. Dep I mean, if I if I had the charging and I had the right driving, I think Tycon base. I'd rather have a Tycon than a GTI and a Cayman. If the if the if the EV lifestyle worked with my lifestyle, I would rather have a Tycon than a yeah for sure. Because a Tycon is a Cayman. It's real special. It's yeah. an electric Cayman, yeah. basically more than an electric Panamera. So I'd rather just have that. Uh, Andrew Damiani says, "What are your thoughts on the traditional auto show?" Uh, is COVID the final nail in the coffin? There's more words there, but we don't need them. Um, auto shows are really great for like families and regular folks that want to like sit in and touch and and do things with cars. I don't. I haven't been to an auto show. I mean, five years maybe. I haven't been to one I wanted to go to. Yeah, in I don't give 20. a shit. But 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 people go, people go, and they they. They see if they. It's a good opportunity for you to sit in a bunch of different, you know, competitive, competitive sure. vehicles, and and I think to an enthusiast, it seems like maybe it's a dead thing, but I think that that people do like to go. I think our job jades us to it. We see enough of the cars in person, right? You know, and we see enough of the information. If you're not, if you don't have this job, then it is a really exciting thing because you're basically going to all the dealerships at once when they get the newest thing, and right. you're not, and they probably won't have the boring stuff there. And you, like you said, you can sit in it, touch it, see what you really think, and that's a really fun thing to do if you're into cars. I, just, I don't think you have to go every year. I think you go every like five, and right. you kind of get like, the gist of it. Yeah. But I, whether or not they'll get rid of it, it depends on. I think they'll bring it back if they can. It just that that's like a marketing question. How much money did they get when they would spend? spend how much money did they get back when they'd go to auto shows versus how much did they make? You know, just operating the way they did last year. Yeah, some manufacturers fucking just be like, nah, I'm not doing auto shows. They don't need them. They don't. You know, because Ferrari doesn't need them. You know, and then sometimes when that happens, when the manufacturer bails out, a local dealer will pick up the slack, and the local dealer will get the booth. You know, right. that'll happen, uh, and they won't always make a distinction <laughs> a, fr a friend of a friend used to do um event stuff for audi and would oh. set up their booths at the big shows and those booths cost high six figures oh to yeah set up. so it's oh, like yeah. that's the kind of money they were spending to yeah. go to the new york auto show yeah yeah uh ryan vance wants to know what's a stock package that doesn't exist but should example outpack sti oh okay i like that that'd be fun i mean it's a safari sti i, I think nissan should sell a juke r I mean, or, or whatever they call it now, a Kixar, a Kixer, a huh? The Juke R is yeah, the Juke crazy. R was cool. Um, things that don't a fucking a, a BRZ STI. That's a package that should, should exist. Put a turbo yeah. on the goddamn thing. BRZ STI for sure. That's a good one. Um, and also, I would like an official. I don't know if it. I'm sure it might, it might exist. It might exist eventually, but I would like an official Porsche Safari. 911. I would like a I would like a lifted 911 that that I can fucking send it a little bit. 
I think if they took a Camaro body and put it on a Tahoe chassis, you know, full micro machine status, they'd probably the sell a ton. Yeah. They'd, <laughs> <laughs> they'd sell a ton of them. They'd sell a ton That'd of them. That would be fun. But I mean, like, way beyond Safari Lift, you know, just we're thinking. Oh, America Mobile? America Mobile. Oh, yeah. An OEM America Mobile. There could definitely would be, be OEM America for sure. Yeah. Thank you, Ryan. Headlouse says, I'm just getting into watches and read a lot of hate about Shinola. What's your take, Shinola? I like I like these. Those are my favorite kind of thread starters. I've heard everyone talking shit about this company. What do you think? It's like a that's, weird, it's like a newscast. That's how I got chased off of Reddit. From Shinola? Unpopular opinion. Matt Farah drives too fast in the mm. canyons. What's your well, take? Right. Which led to like 5,000 people being like, yeah, fuck that guy. And I, now I don't use Reddit anymore. I decided that that platform is did not want me, and so I didn't. Matt, a lot it. of people are saying that the shirt you're wearing is terrible. A lot it's of fine. people are saying this. What is your response? <laughs> um, I have a problem with Shinola personally, uh, which has absolutely nothing to do with their watches. When Axel, uh, rest in peace, Axel, was going in for his surgery for cancer, I was wearing a Shinola watch, and I posted a picture on Instagram holding Axel with like an IV going into him, like you know, prayers for my cat going in for surgery, and the Shinola brand person tagged themselves in my photo. I found that personally offensive. Like they added their tag of like, oh yeah, Shinola watch is represented. Yeah, and in the yeah, comments. That's not, that's not great. Yeah, it was not good. Not good. <laughs> so I was personally offended by that, and so there's that's my reason for not liking Shinola. That just means the the company there hired the wrong 23-year-old. Yeah, beyond that, yeah. I don't really care. Why do watch people not like Shinola? Because A, Shinola is a fake brand. Shinola is, is a, this sort of made in Detroit thing. The watches use movements, the parts, they're assembled. It, it, it's assembled in Detroit from parts made in Asia. And also, it's the brother of the guy who started Fossil. So it's like Fossil, there's nothing wrong with a Fossil watch, but like... It's not a watch guy watch, and so it's fruit of the, the poison tree. I don't give a shit. I care about the fact that this guy fucking commented on my cat getting sick post. It might that's, have just been a bot. They might have a I, bot that, I maybe. swear to God, they well, might have fine. a bot that just- That's fine. Just their just bot offended it, yeah. me personally. Yeah. And I don't think their watches are good watches. I think they're cheaply made, and I think it's, it's there's a lot, and it's not just Shinola. There's a lot of brands- if you look at a watch, quality freezes at about $500 and starts improving again around $3,000. Any watch, and I mean fucking any, almost any watch. Cameron Weiss's watches, where I've seen him make the movements, mm -hmm. he doesn't sell, his watches are too cheap. Cameron Weiss's watches should be $5,000, not what they're actually being sold for. With the exception of that, big big companies, right? And there's a couple other small people not charging enough for their dope shit, okay? Accepting those people. There is a freeze at quality between 2500, uh, 500 and 2500 You should not buy a watch in that range. <laughs> because you're paying for a $500 watch with whatever dollars of branding they can jam on top of it and story and fake heritage and whatnot. So you sh you should not look at watches yeah. in that region. I don't like the asterisk where it's like, well, it's assembled here. Like, well, where is it made? You know. Yeah. And dude, fucking buy Cameron's movements. You want to make a watch in America? Yeah. There we go. American watchmaker, order fucking two thousand movements from him. Let's go. You know what I mean? But I don't give. You know, I don't give a fuck. And I'm not gonna sneer at you if I see you at Cars and Coffee wearing a fucking Shinola watch. I was taken. I bought one. I was taken by the thing in the beginning. I bought, and me and Spike both bought watches in Detroit. We went to the Shinola headquarters and fucking they brought in all this shit. We bought watches. And then it was like, oh, wait a minute. What? Where, where are these parts from? And then and then after that, they commented on the cat post. I was like, all right. I fucking sold that watch and did not look back. Uh, last question. Not even a question. Shout out to Mr. Cal, big truck driver, still slaps Spencer, mind it is. Mr. Cal, big truck driver, does still slap. I'm gonna slap. listen to that on the way home. Everything clean but the ashtray. Clean but the Love ashtray. it. Thank you guys for uh, for joining us tonight. Uh, there's a lot of you that added questions. 
while we uh, were doing those, and and we we just don't have the time today. We'll stay. We'll storm in the archive for you for the next uh, crew show. We will get to them. But uh, we have we have ladies waiting for dinners at home. Very true. And uh, and it's late in the evening, and we woke up very early in the morning to go film multiple cars uh, this morning. And so until uh, the next show, which is what when's tomorrow? tomorrow we got Jason Finsky. Uh, tomorrow what three p.m. Pacific? I think three thirty. 3.30 Pacific, Jason Fenske, Engineering Explained, uh, is going to be here, and we're going to be talking about all different kinds of fucking things. I love Fenske. Probably, probably going to be talking about cats, honestly. I want to learn about the EV grid from him. Is oh, the grid. The yeah, no, I'd yeah, like yeah. to talk about the grid. Let's definitely talk about the grid, but also cats. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get a snack every night. This guy should. All righty, then. Thank you all for listening and donating. Good night. Cheers.